Greetings. <laughs> the Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by Lending Tree. Did you know that depending on where you get your mortgage, you could save $20,000 or more? $20,000 or more. But 80% of people only get one mortgage offer. And if you go with your bank, chances are you'll get ripped off. Maybe screwed. Lending Tree doesn't want that to happen. So what we're going to do is this. Are you sure you have the best deal? We'll find out how much you can save today by going to LendingTree.com slash church. Again, that's LendingTree.com slash church. LendingTree, LLC, NMLS, number 1136. Terms and conditions apply. But listen, don't get ripped off. Go to LendingTree.com right now. Another thing, it's summertime. The winter's coming. The holidays are coming, Thanksgiving coming, you're still lonely. You know why? Because you look like a Mortovan. Your underwears, you're still wearing tidy whities with skid marks, and they got that yellow stain in the front. Who, who wants to be with you? Listen, you want to look good in your underwear and be comfortable, right? But that perfect balance is hard to find. Don't sacrifice style or comfort. Check out MeUndies.com and find out why the best pair of underwear, why they're the best pair of underwear right now. Right now, MeUndies is an exclusive offer just for the church family. We're going to give you 20% off your first pair and free shipping. And MeUndies is so sure you'll love the underwear, they'll give you 100% satisfaction guarantee. You order a pair, you don't love them, you get a full refund. Refund. It's a no-brainer. 20% off free shipping, 100% satisfaction guarantee. What the hell are you waiting for? Go to MeUndies.com right now slash Joey and get 20% off your first order. Kick this motherfucking mule, Lee. Oh, shit. I want to see nothing but assholes and elbows. It's a church of what's happening now. Wednesday. Assholes and elbows. August 23rd, 2017. Get your shit together. Sounds like a guy fighting his way out of a prison rape. We ain't fucking around here. Elbows and assholes. Take that meal, please. Oh, yeah. Are you fucking kidding me or what? Again, you filthy animal. Oh. This is what black people were black people. You understand? But listen, listen to that music. Anything could happen. <laughs> Church, what's happening now, you bad motherfuckers? Bert Kreischer, my yeah. favorite Christ killer, Lisa Yan. That's going to be a good one, motherfuckers. Ready? Here you go. Put your head down. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> Give it to me. Oh, open that little bat. It's a church of what's happening now. How bad of a jam is that? That's fucking amazing. You know what's crazy? She didn't do it anymore live after she became a born again Christian. Oh, oh for real? Why? Yeah. <laughs> Because people start fucking in the audience, right? You hear that song, you're like, wait a second, oh, somebody's got to yeah. suck my dick. How about you with the Yankee hat on? <laughs> <laughs> How about you with the Yankee hat on? <laughs> Bert Christ is here this evening. It's a late podcast, but that's how we do it. We got to put the girls to sleep. I had to take the girls <laughs> swimming. Today she got promoted to the higher class. She was oh, jumping. Oh, really? You know, she sits in there for 30 minutes, and it's like a constant smile. And every 10 minutes, she looks over to watch if you're watching them, and you have to give them a heads up. You yeah. Know what I'm saying? And they go fucking bananas. She got out. Where did I take them to eat tonight? I took them to, they wanted to go to fucking uh, Jersey Mice. Yeah. She kept saying she wanted to go to the salami restaurant, <laughs> which made me think, what the fuck? Who's giving out dick? <laughs> Who's giving out stinky fucking Italian dick around here? So we went in there. You know, it's a real pleasure to... <laughs> 
especially where I came from. You came from a tight-knit family to be doing the little things I do. We go home, we fucking go on the computer. I make a type in Smurfs and fucking trolls and spell yeah. it for me. We sit there, and then after 15 minutes, she looks me straight in the face. She goes, Daddy, can you leave now? I'm <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, thanks for throwing me out of my fucking office. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. That's that's my nights. You just dress for 15 minutes. She goes, you know what? Take a fucking hike. Yeah. And I bet you go through the same thing at a different level in your home. And today, today, Isla said to me, uh, I said, I said I was working, and she said, she pulled me aside in the room and goes, hey, could you not work so much? And I said, no. She goes, no, I mean, like, is there a way for you to, like, work one less day a week? She goes, you're working every night, and I feel like I don't get to do things with you. I was like, I know, but that's kind of my job happens at night. And I try to do stuff during the day. I worked all day today, too, and all night. And then I said, okay. I said, don't worry. I'm doing Joey's podcast tonight, but I'm not going to get picked up till 9. That's your bedtime. So we watch Wreck-It Ralph. And I, I said to her at 8.30, I said, now Joey may come at like 8.45, so just so you know, I may have to leave early. And I just kind of rolled her eyes, got real frustrated. And then I, and then you called, and you called right when the movie ended. I said, Joey's outside. And Nala goes, you held your promise. <coughs> I was like, yeah, of course I did. <laughs> I would have left at 8.45. <laughs> but but she, uh, she talked about it on my podcast. I was doing the intro to my podcast this afternoon, and she walked in the man cave and started talking about all the podcast. But yeah, that fucking sucks that they grow up, man. I said, I, I I wish I had listened to you guys earlier. I think it was a mistake doing Travel Channel as long as I did. I needed to do it because I needed the money, and I enjoyed the experience. I had a great time, but I was gone for such long chunks that I really missed out on a lot of shit. You know what I mean? And then on the weeks I had off, I'd do stand-up, and it was just burning it at both ends. I had a dad who worked at night. And yeah, he, he he wasn't there as much, but I mean, co- college for me was fifty grand a year. When it's yeah. when, when your kids go to school, it's going to be a hundred grand a year. Yeah. So like, you'll need that. Like, it's I don't know. So you become a comedian, and for some of us, you know, I mean, I, one thing about me is I got a job three months into comedy that paid me two hundred dollars a month doing comedy. Yeah. Which not a lot of people have. No. I got 25 bucks a night. Yeah, that's how when I, I first started. Yeah. yeah. So it's like now if I did one show a week, that's what I got paid for. You don't leave from 1991. And I got no reason to bullshit to 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 2001. It was basically hand to mouth. Yeah. Like we were talking about taxes. I didn't pay taxes from 91 to 2003. When I went to the IRS, they said, "Listen, it's we only go back 7 years." You only go back seven years. And I laughed and I said, I'm a stand up. We started getting into the conversation. And I go, I'm a stand up comedian that started in 91. Yeah. I go, I didn't make a dime. I go, I was making, I could have collected food stamps. It was like eight grand a year when I lived in Seattle. I lost money when I first yeah, started. I did the math. It was yeah. like $8,600 that one year in 95 I made. But, you know, you, you look at the years that you starve for, and then life starts becoming life. But then life throws a little curveball at you. It gets you a hot ass girlfriend. And you're living in LA and you're doing stores, comedy spots at the store. Next thing you know, Judd Apple calls you. You do two episodes of Crash and now you're selling tickets. Let me ask you something. And let me ask the people at home. You know, you have this family, but at the same time, you have this job that's Thursday through Saturday. You're going to start small, you're not going to start at $25 a night. And also, the more you go out, the more you build an audience and the more yeah. money you make. It's a no-brainer. But it's just like anything else in life, Bert. Not everybody is the same. Yeah. My first love of this comedy game was Richard Pryor. My second love was Andrew Dice Clay and then Bill Hicks and then Kennison. But in there was a guy by the name of Joe Rogan. Yeah. And I really learned a lot from him. And he was the lu- he's the luckiest man in the world because he creates his own opportunities. He got on news radio, <clears throat> and news radio ended when the guy got shot, basically. Then he had like a year off. He already had that notoriety. I still remember, he told me once, what they were paying him on the road when he was on news radio, and it was nothing. Really? And then one time they offered him Carolines like three days before, and he got a first-class ticket. 
that was a hundred dollars more than what they were paying them. He told me the story. Like they weren't paying them dick on the road. Really? You know? Yeah, and the road the very after news radio. Then when Fear Factor came, he got busy, but all this shit happened. And it was like he was burning the candle at both ends. But I noticed that Fear Factor was paying him, which gave him a big advantage over a lot of other comics that they don't necessarily need to go out. Yeah. The, when you buy a three million dollar house because you're making twenty grand for two years and all of a sudden your show gets canceled and your crowds go to half, guess what? You're in a fucking predicament. Yeah. That means you gotta go out fifty weeks a year to keep the fucking lights on. And you put your your kid in Campbell Hall, that's another thirty four oh. which is starting to crack me up. I couldn't wait to have you on the podcast to talk about like the school that your daughter goes to, or both of them, and the one mine's going to go to, supposedly, I even went and looked it up. It's a high-rated fucking school in the valley. Like, Number one school in the valley. But you'll talk to people, and when you ask them where your kid's going to go, they'll tell you how they're going to go to a private school. And then when you tell them you're going to go to that school, they roll their fucking eyes at you. I've had this ten times the last two weeks. I even had a kid that was selling lemonade on the corner. I went with my daughter. I see this poor kid with a mother in 90 degree heat selling fucking lemonade. I run home. I see I go, come on, girls. Let's take a walk. Let's yeah. take a, you know, Studio Studies is a nice fucking place. Let's take like a little walk. We take yeah. a walk. We get to the corner. The girl's five. You know, right away she starts torturing Mercy. You know, you're four. I'm five. You're still a baby. And Mercy's like, fuck you, bitch. Just give me some lemonade. The little, Dad, little, can I fish sugar? The little, the little fat girl wanted a dollar for the fucking glass of this lemonade. So uh, the little girl asked Mercy, are you in school yet? And Mercy goes, yeah. You know, I go, no, I, and Mercy doesn't know what the fuck's going on. The girl's torturing her. Yeah. She goes, well, I got to this school. And, and my wife asked the mom, well, don't you live close to it? She goes, yeah, right down the block. She goes, why wouldn't you go to this grammar school? And the little girl goes, yuck. Like, I got to this school. And me, my daughter, and my fucking wife looked at the little girl. And the mother finally goes, don't say that. Like, where'd she hear that from? Yeah. She heard it from you, you stanky fuck. So as we're walking back, that's why she's my blood and my daughter, and that's why I, I go on the road and do the shit I don't want to do. <laughs> yeah. She looked at me, and she goes, Daddy, she was mean. And I didn't like her lemonade anyway. She just threw it up in the fucking <laughs> hand. I go, you know what? That's why I fucking stay at home two weeks of fucking. That's when you go and get her pony. You're like, Listen, I'm going to get man, a pony right now. Fucking what's his name was here three weeks ago. Who? This guy goes out on the road every week and he's 60. I'm embarrassed. Who? Ron White. Ron White. I'm embarrassed. Oh, yeah. But at the same time, he has no children. Yeah, well, no, he's got a son. He's got a son, but he's an older. I yeah. think his son works for him. And yeah. I think he just... I'm, I'm, yeah, he just got divorced. Yeah, he just got, got divorced. Or one so if I was him, I'd, I'd live yeah, on the fucking live road. Yeah, on the road. I'd live on the when road. When you have nobody at home, listen, you know how many times on a Friday I'm sitting on my couch and I go... I could have been on the road this weekend. <laughs> yeah. You know, my wife just informed me that she's going to a fucking women's party with the kid tomorrow around the corner. And Sunday they got church. I'm not even going to fucking see him anyway. I got a spot here. Well, what the fuck did I stay home for? Yeah. If my wife's on a period, I don't, I'm don't. i definitely on the road. <laughs> oh, those are the dates you picked to go on the oh, road? If she, I'm on her All cycle. Right. Yeah, yeah. You always did. I said, keep me in town for the girls' birthdays. Halloween, Halloween, Mother's Day, Thanksgiving, Father's Christmas. Day. I gotta work New Year's Eve, and then every night, every time you have a period, your period, I went on the road. And now my daughter's cycle, Georgia. I shouldn't say that out loud, but I guess Georgia is a oh, woman now. I don't want to hear this shit. <laughs> and, and her cycle is the same as Leanne's cycle, because so, I guess that's what happens. And so they all their cycles team up. So now I'm, I'm out when both of them are just both bitchy as fuck. I used to. That's fucking a good get, idea. I used to get coked up with this girl. And she let me eat a little monkey, huh. whack off on the titties and shit like that. Whenever I was in the mood for it, but he was a tremendous ear beat you had to take from her. Yeah. And then she played the card like, why should she let you eat a pussy for an hour? You know, but you kept snorting coke and yeah, whatever. Yeah. And next thing you know, you eat a little monkey and shit. I knew her cycle. So on those nights when she called me drunk and go, where are you? I'll be there in an hour. Fuck you. <laughs> I can't, you know what I'm saying? I do her cycle. Yeah, if I can't eat your monkey, I'm not wasting a gram on you to take that ear beating without the yeah. dick sucking. <laughs> How do you keep f- that information in your head? I just love that you chose. I just knew from the 22nd to the 27th, <laughs> she's bleeding. 
From the 22nd to the 27th, oh. she's bleeding. There's no reason to go over there. Not even to say hello. I had a chick Fuck pussy it. when she was on her period once. That's disgusting. She didn't tell me we were too young. We were like 17. And I guess she had her period, but she didn't. Uh, you know, it's like now my wife would just be like, hey, I'm on my period. You can't do that. But I guess it's 17. That's something you just go. I won't say that to anybody. I'll just hope I hope it's not that bad. <laughs> I was coked up one night in Miami, and I hooked up with this girl, and that she told me from the beginning, so I knew I was a dead man. Oh. But after a fucking few grams of coke, I said, take that little bat out and show it to me. She goes, I, since I had my period, I didn't really shave it. She took off her panties. It looked like fucking Julius Irving. It had so much hair. <laughs> I cut through that fucking thing. I took that tampon. I pushed it to the side, that little fuse. Yeah. And I just licked that clip for about 10 minutes until I came in my pants, and I just went to sleep. That's the only time I ever messed around with a girl at that time of the month. Oh. So what did you do? Close your eyes? You pa- you passed out with I a blood. I just listened. I was on fucking two eight balls of oh. coke. You could stab me with 22 needles. It wouldn't matter at that time. <laughs> I was like Whitney Houston at the time of death, numb. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Whitney died of. She was so numb, she went in the bathtub, and she didn't feel the temperature of the water. What? That's a true story. Watch fucking uh, autopsy. A lot of people, she didn't die from, she died from cocaine, but in a different way. Was it too hot? The water was, was too, too hot. hot. She boiled herself? Something weird happened to her. Oh, oh the f- thing, and she slipped and hit her head. Something weird. The uh, there's, a, there's a thing that happens when you get into a really hot bathtub, it rises your blood pressure. Uh, I read a book about this when I was a kid, about a... They, um, if they, I don't know, fuck, I forget how it goes, but they were making baths. They were giving these people this medication that raised their blood pressure and then giving them and putting them in a, as soon as they got into a hot bath, they just die because I don't know. I, I don't know. It's the same reason they see you see on hot tubs. People with heart problems shouldn't get into this hot tub. If you've been drinking, don't get in this hot tub. It's because your blood pressure is up. I can't go into hot tubs because I always get styes. I don't know. I have bad luck with hot tubs. Styes? Yeah. Well, first off. Who goes into a hot tub? It's 2018. <laughs> I love hot tubs. If you're going into a hot tub, you better flow. I want to do what? Listen to Jimmy Buffett records and drink tequila in there. I would love what to have a hot tub. What the fuck are you going to do in a fucking hot tub like a fucking monkey? Anything. Get a steamer, a Spitz, you know. I, w- I want to get one of those outdoor uh, saunas. Yeah. Those little circle wood things. Yeah. I would love one of those. With all the fucking diseases and all the oh, fucking... Yeah. That is crazy when you think about all the fucking diseases of, that are in a hotel pool. And then people just get in the hot tub. That stew of just, you know, there's cum in there. You know, every kid pisses in there. Nobody takes a shower. Scabs. You got to assume for some... Listen, for some Americans, a pool jump is a shower. <laughs> Yeah. There's some people who think by jumping in the pool, they get out and clean. They don't swipe their ass. Yeah. They don't scrub the nuts. The same way dead skin develops around your face and you got to get off of a loofah. Yeah. What do you think develops around your skin? When you get a, when oh. you, become, you watch the 600 pound life, when you become one of those fat fucks and you stop oh, bathing. My daughters and, and I are obsessed with my 600 pound life. Is that the best show on television? It obsessed. The obsessed. best show on television. I watched four episodes. The two brothers that hated each other, those two morons, oh. and the one brother that went, the one kid that was on pills, that the finally, the kid finally said to him, you know, if you, the next time you fake pain and go to an emergency room and get a prescription, they're going to charge you with a felony because you've already exceeded the amount of lifetime prescriptions a person could get in Texas. Really? You know, when you're a fat fuck, I think that that show does something to you. Yeah. Like you have to watch it and go, I don't want to be that person. But those people who that happens to, it's a toss-up. I sit there and watch it, and I wa- listen to their words, and I watch their environment, and I think what happened. Like, the fat dude was yeah. on pills. You know, what makes a person go, you know what? I lost my job, and part of it could be the beginnings of depression. But now the depression is worn off, and there you are, eight hundred fucking pounds later. Yeah, it's it was a weird thing about the show. It, like, there's a lot of people who whined on it, like who like pretend like they're trying to lose weight. There was a couple like women on the first because I haven't had cable for a couple of years, so the for the first few seasons, there were some women who just. Like, we just lie, and they had cameras in their faces. Well, nobody, nobody. Showing what they ate. Nobody is going to. 
Oh yeah, everyone lies about what I mean. It's it, no, it's uh, it's a sickness. Absolutely. Uh, oh. One kid that was eating how many pizza pies? The kid up in New Hampshire, the brothers. That was the one kid. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, kid yeah. had a, he would call his father from Houston to order Domino's for him in Houston, and the dad was in New Hampshire. Yeah, he was order. Was he not eating eight pizzas a day? It's you know I I. I, I don't I deal with uh I think my real addiction in life is food meaning like like tonight when I go home it's gonna be really it's it's a real battle for me to just go lay in the bed and go to sleep and I want to eat something when I get home like and I've been there where you just go fuck it and then you just start eating and you just can't stop you're like I'm already a you know and I but I've and I've been the biggest I was 265 and when I was at 265 part of you is just like I can't turn this boat around. We're sailing so fast in this direction. I don't know how to turn this boat around. And then finally, when you start getting momentum, you're like, "Oh, there we go." It's like it's like I don't know, man. I empathize with those people. I empathize with those people because I go, I feel like I'm. I've been there. I've been there. You oh, know, I was on my way. I would have been absolutely. You were huge. Yeah, and I'm. I've gained like 15, 20 pounds back. I was. I was three fifteen. I got down to two twenty seven, and I'm two forty five, two forty seven right now. The longest yard for a second. The the fucking when we all jump in the lakes. I forget you were bigger than this. Watch. This. Like I forget you were big. Like whenever this is on. Like you scroll down and there's a scene that it says you're the longest yard Comedy Central. Yeah. If it's at like the hour mark, I'll put it on just to watch that scene, and it makes me feel like the 600 pound man. I forget. I forget you were big, and I forget Segura was big. You gotta watch this scene. Like Segura still looks fat to me when I see him. No, I saw him Friday. <laughs> he looks tremendous. He's a fucking asshole. Yeah, he looks really good. He looks really good. <laughs> He really it, worked. Him and Rogan are like, birth gained all the way back. Dude, I'm still 222. 27, uh, yeah. I was 217, and then I, I went back up to 222 the other day. But, uh, but yeah, I'm still 220. I'm, that's why I float at 220. Up and down. And so, uh, but I'd like to get, I, I don't know if I want to get, like, I don't know if I want to do my next special at 205, where I look good, like. What are you at right now? Right now, 220. Probably 220, 222. Yeah, flooded practice field. If you want, where are you, where are you at right now? Today probably three. Yeah, really? You don't look like you don't look like you're three hundred pounds. Go all the way to the end. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Click it there. You guys are gonna see something that's really fucking absurd. This every time I see this, I go, oh my god. Ah oh, shit! I took it out. All right, go to the other one. Hey, when you were, when was was Chris Rock fun to work with? Um, yeah, everybody in that movie was. Did you? you know, did he hang out or was he? Go to that one. What scene? Um, those guys came and went. That's Chris really? Rock. Like he would come and shoot uh, three scenes and then leave for a week. And you can't blame someone like that. He's got kids. He's keeping no, a marriage no, together. No, 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 no. But I do. I, if I was that guy, I'd be hanging out a lot. Who, Chris Rock? Yeah, I'd be. At, I'd be on set, fucking around. And my favorite things are being on set. Well, he came with his family. You know, we shot long days. And uh, was that Goldberg? The, yeah, some of the guys hung out, and some of them did. You know, look at that. That's look you? At that. Look at that. Just look at that. See if the other, they have another scene. If they have That's the you? End. Yeah. How much were you weighing there? At that point, I was... Click it to see the third one. They have another one to see. Okay. Them. Look at that. Look at my stomach. That yeah. you're... I just saw your face. Your face doesn't even look like you. No. It was... Keep going, keep going. No. So wait, how how right big there, was A little bit more. You? Have you ever seen the rain scene? Go up, go up, go up, go up, go up, go up. Go right up. there. Go up right there. How big were you? At that point right there, I was 380. So you weren't even at your highest? No, I walked on that set 
maybe 360. As soon as I hit New Mexico, I probably gained 15 fucking pounds right off the bat. When I got home from New Mexico, I went to the doctor because they kept busting my balls about blood pressure. What was your blood pressure at the time? Look at that. And I was at... I think, you know how the scale goes all the way to 350? Yeah. He kept pushing it, and he finally said to me, it ends at 350. But when it's here, you're probably at 390 right now. Wow. So that was like, uh, watch this now. You ready? If they keep this fucking saying it. Who's that guy? Look at that. Oh, my God. Wait, go back and just freeze it on that one pot, spot, can you? Yeah. That doesn't even look like you, Joey. Now, what you don't see is my hands are up. Yeah. That's as high as my hands could probably go then. That's number one. Number two, that my stomach was as extended as my chest at the time. Yeah. Like, I had so much fat over here, like, that had developed right here. Really? Like, when I felt this bone, I went to the doctor immediately. I'm like, I got cancer. <laughs> and he goes, no, you don't. That's your fucking... Like, he goes, what do you mean you never felt that? I, go, I haven't felt this in years. Yeah. That's how, because all that fat, I had built out a bunch of fat under my ribs. My tits oh, and my Jesus. fucking stomach were one. Dude. My chest and my stomach were one. I, You know, my there's pictures of me. If you go online, you can find them. There, there's pictures of me. Just type in Fat Bert. And, man, when I was 265, and I, and that's not, but it's not it's not far off. Man, that, I I was, I didn't even know I was fat. I really did I thought I was like, no, nah, man, I got a big, I got a barrel chest. I wasn't weighing myself. That's the key. That's the key. You if have you to weigh, weigh yourself. yourself. If you weigh yourself every day, it's then scary. you're held accountable. And you find out. You really find out, shit, what did I drink last night? Oh, I ate this. I ate that. Yeah. No, you're fit there. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go, I'll show you. That's that. nothing. That's there. nothing. That's nothing. Type in Fat Bert, uh, Preston, and Steve. Okay, scroll down. I'll show you down. Scroll down. Scroll down. You'll see it. Me in a Speedo, in a jean short Speedo. Oh, Jesus. Uh, right there, to the right. Yeah. Look at that. What were you there? 265. Drinking Fireball. And drink and and Jack at six in the morning at Preston and Steve. Yeah, but you know it was M Night Shyamalan was there and it was a fun time. <laughs> I had a good time. I can't lie to you. Now, when you go to those radio shows in the yeah. morning, you get hammered in the morning. You go home, sleep it off. Yeah, I, well, I don't get. Up. I don't get like I, you know. I not it's like to, it's like me eating four or five stars. Right. You get a little buzz, but I get buzzed, and then, then and then I go to bed, and I wake up, and I get on the treadmill, and I walk, or I'll just go right to the club, wake up right before the show, go to the club. But it's not getting like, like I, if my wife did it, she wouldn't be able to function. But if I can do it very easily, I will say that I am I am healthier. Like I, I definitely feel better in the weekend when that doesn't happen. Like when you go in and do radio and there's no booze, and they're like, no, no, like like uh, I'm I forget where I was just at. But there was no booze, and I was like, "Oh, okay, that's fine. I don't mind. I don't mind not drinking. But if they're gonna have a cocktail, I'll have a fucking cocktail, you know." So it's the same way. If like someone lit a joint, you're not gonna say no. You'd be like, "I'll take a hit," you know. But those the, those radio shows, some of them get out of control. Some like those calling sick to work tours I do. Those are insane, man. I've been on stage where I've been blacked out and not been able to function. <laughs> And then you go home. How long do you need to sleep to be back that You want to know what happened? So I was in Tampa, and uh, I do a call sick to work show. I go to Cowhead's show, Mike Calta. I do his show, and we start drinking on air, and, and, I, and I start drinking uh, uh, Manhattans, and, I, and I'm not even... Oh, my God. At what time? It's like 7 in the morning. Oh. Show's at 10, or, or show's at noon, but we get done at 10, and we drink all morning, and I and I don't feel it. I'm really not feeling it. And then I get to the club. I'm a little buzzed, but it's sold out. It, they've already drank the club out of beer. The fans drank everyone out of beer. The, there's no beer left. All they're making is mixed drinks. So that means just everyone's already fucking hammered. Now they're going to get more hammered because they can't get any but mixed drinks. So I get on stage, and they start sending fireballs like crazy. Like, like 
but, but maybe I maybe I did. I don't even know how many I did. All I know is I blacked out. I did a meet and greet. Don't remember any of the meet and greet. Um, there are pictures of me with my eyes just like this. Like, huh? My dad picks me up, and my parents had built a new house that I'd never been to. So I I remember my old house. My dad picks me up, takes me to my new house, his new house that he's living in, with my mom. I pass out in the guest room. I wake up. My dad's not there, and I have no fucking idea where I am. <laughs> I get up. I'm like, okay, I don't know what state I'm in. I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm trying to, you know how you wake up some mornings, you're like, wait, where the fuck am I? I'm like, am I in Tampa? I'm like, fuck, I'm literally panicking, looking around this house. I don't recognize anything. I've never been to this house. And then my dad walks in. I go, what are you doing here? And he's like, oh. Boy, buddy, you were you were in a rough mode when I picked you up. I was like, I, I didn't know who the fuck's house I was at. But yeah, those those call and stick to work shows get out of control. Now, how many hours do you have to, get, have to sleep to wake up and be tip top magoo? Four. Oh God. Oh my God. Yeah. Four. Like, see, like when you come in here and you watch us eating edibles, uh, that blows me away. And you get blown away. I get, I'm blown away. That does nothing. Like we. <laughs> What you professionals do, and I gotta tell you something. I grew up in a bar. Yeah. I grew up around people who drink. You know, I know who's faking the funk. Yeah. To be cool, and I know who's really rocking and rolling. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I know a lot of comedians that fake the funk to be cool. Like, yeah, I just, I've been drinking all the time. Yeah. 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 Like, That's great. I'll tell your little fucking buddies at the improv that and impress them. <laughs> But I know motherfuckers who really, and you're one of those guys, and I've always admired that. Number one, I'm a child of the 70s. What did you see on TV in the 70s? When I was on uh, Rogan's the other day, I showed him the beginning of the original Longest Yard. Everybody in the 70s. Oh, that was great. Everybody in the house in the 70s, everybody, every TV show, at one point or another, knock on the door, open it up, come in. And Bert would get up, and there wasn't like, would you like a drink, or what yeah. are you drinking? You turned around, and there was a glass thing that was brown. It could be anything, wild turkey, yeah. bur- it could be anything. And they poured two, and they gave you one, and the gentleman drank it. What is this? It's gin. Well, I'm on antibiotics right now. No! Nobody yeah. was on antibiotics. And if you did, you were too embarrassed <laughs> to tell somebody. <laughs> Just give me the fucking whiskey and drink it. You know, I tried that, Bert. I desperately tried to fit in as a drinker early on. And it was like I would puke. I would pass out. But I'm the same way that you are with booze with weed. Because I don't mind smoking a little weed. Like, I can, I, I have a, only because I'm running a lot, I, I hit out of this Pax vaporizer. And it just, it, in my opinion, I don't feel it in my lungs the next day. Like I it, like the Pax. But I like the one that you put weed in. This is that's this one. No, because you said it's got a. Plug. I got two. I got two. I got one okay. to travel with. Right. And then I got this one. We that's, packed. That's the, weed the in best the thing going. Oven. And that's for me, jogging wise, it doesn't fuck with my lungs. That's the best one going. Because when I when I hit like a, I this sounds so silly, but like if I hit a joint with paper, I can t- feel it the next day when I run. Listen, that's a very LA statement. No, <laughs> no, it's not. I need this weed for my jogging. Why the fuck do you think I smoke out of a bong? Actually, yeah. Bronson was here the other day. That really? kid could smoke out. You had Action Bronson on? Yeah, he could smoke for fucking days. Dude, his first album was fucking phenomenal. Great. I just listened to this shit. It's great. There's a there's the song. You guys don't play music on here? Yeah, we do whatever oh, the fuck you want. This is the song that I fucking I've just I I man, I'm really impressed with that kid. Yeah, me too. I say kid only because I'm so much older than him. But uh Action Bronson, the Dr. Lecter album. Is it uh Suede, have you heard that? I don't know. I don't think so. Is it this one? Exhale the fucking essence. I love this. I just like this beat. Pista, Lani Lantel, everything is Marvel kid on this side. We shine like the sun, though the night brings. Dude, every fucking rhyme he's got, I like. This one, this is one that first turned me on to him. Rosalino. Fuck that sitting down rap type shit, man. I stand up because I'm a motherfucking man. I just love the I love the cadence of it. Keep it. I'm on the third floor. Your class was in the basement. You know what that means. You got a hint of retardation. Well, me too. I'm fully blown just like the flow, though. 
with the silky shit that's ankle length like a kimono. Uh, sharp instruments to rock like a fossil. I love, dude. I love Action Bronson. You know what, man? I didn't know who he was. Oh, he's great, People man. That's so great. Shit from the Rogan podcast. Lee oh, you guys got me. must have got him fucking Lee hammered. Kept telling me to bring him on. He came on. Dog, he didn't stop rolling joints. He smokes constantly. Like, constantly. If you can get cancer from marijuana, he'll be the he'll test. Be the one. <laughs> he'll be the first guy. It's hysterical. I could go bong the bong. I mean, I could smoke bongs all fucking night. Yeah, he smokes dab. He's a big dab guy. Yeah, right? I can't do it. That's it. I'm done with all that shit. Why, why don't you do dabs? Because I don't want to blow torch a fucking house. I, I listen. Yeah, because I guess if you got that blowtorch going and you're doing a dab and you pass out, listen, you light a fucking house on fire. It's, it's, no, a, fuck, it's a joke. It's a fucking joke. <laughs> I grew up in the fucking it's 80s. Safety on it. People were having a great time. <laughs> People were going out and going bird. You want to do a blast? Yeah, let's get a grandma blow. People yeah. were having a great time. And then one day, I just graduated high school, and this dude, Steve Vatalanis, comes up to me, calls me, and he goes, Hey, man, I hear you got some good coke. I want to hook you up with this dude. I go, all right, we got my boy Timmy's listening to this. He's dying. He gets in the car with me and Timmy's brother, Roger, and we go down to this hotel in Tunley Avenue. Tunley Avenue was like where fucking crack people hang out. There was no crack at that time, really. It was 19. It was summer of 82. We pull into this nasty hotel. He introduces this black dude with a pimp, cool as shit. And, you know, I give him the Coke. I sell it to him. He gives me the cash. He, he tasted it. He goes, it's tremendous. He didn't say it was tremendous. He says, good stuff. And he goes, uh, you guys ever smoke it? And I'm like, no. And he right there in front of us, it was 2 in the afternoon. Yeah. He cooked it up. Well, you know, in those days, you had like the vial. That, you see that tube right there? Yeah. You'd had one of those, but it was a little thicker. You'd fill it. You'd fill half of it with water, and you'd put uh, a half a gram of Coke in there, and uh, tw two points of baking soda. And you'd shake it up, 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 put some heat to it, and all of a sudden oh the cut God. would burn out, and you'd get a little rock. You, you had to get a fucking silk handkerchief or pay your father's fucking silk socks and lean it and then put the rock on top of there. And then you had to wait five minutes for it to harden. And then I had to take the rock, cut it up, and we'd sit there and put it into a pipe, and we had to start the process all over again. Shake, and it was cool oh, for the yeah. afternoon. Yeah. But we smoked the whole eight ball in 10 fucking minutes, uh -huh. and then I went home. But it was interesting to me. But already, there was a head shop in my uh, in Union City, New Jersey. I forget what it's called. Somebody will hit me up in two minutes on Twitter and tell me, uh, East West. And they had a fucking starter crack kit. What? Starter really? free base. They called it, remember, when it came uh, on yeah, the scene, it was, free it was not crack. It was free base. And you went down there, and for 50 bucks which was a lot of money. I remember paying 50 and going, I could just get a half gram of Coke. Why am I doing this? At that time, I got Coke from a guy named Camel Breath because he smoked Camel cigarettes all the time without filters. And his cigarette, his mustache is orange <laughs> and his fingers are orange. And do you know that till today, he still won't friend me on Facebook. He's I, still alive? Oh, he's still alive, Camel Breath. He's, he's about still smoking? I don't think He had so. to quit. Yeah, he's about 70. If I'm 54... He's got to be 70-something. Oh, my God. <laughs> Camel breath. I, th so I totally get, thought he was Middle Eastern. We used to get Coke. <laughs> no, we used to get Coke from him. And he used to sell us Coke in a vial already. Whenever you got Coke from the Camel, yeah. if you bought an eight ball, <laughs> instead of giving you <laughs> Coke <three>. the Camel. <laughs> <laughs> instead of giving you three and a half, he'd just give you four tubes and call it even. <laughs> So I went over there and bought like 12 eight balls one night. I collected, I did a thing. It was 60 a piece he was giving them to me for. I would sell them for 100. He was doing me a favor. In yeah. Days. In 82, I would, if I was selling for 80, I was still making 20 bucks. So I went over there and bought like fucking 10 of those things. And I went to my buddy's house. We opened up that fucking kit. <laughs> and me, him, and another one of us just started fucking doing that. Kicking it up. And, oh. and I'll never forget waking up on his couch the next morning. There was three of us. Everybody was sleeping. I looked at the table, and every single Coke bottle that I had was turned upside down, like an order, yeah, like bullets. And I'm like, oh my god, we smoked all that shit last night. 
At the end of the day, it just wasn't worth it. How do you pass out when you do that much? We, we, we were doing quaaludes then. Oh, is that we what you did at home? Yeah, we were fucking. Whenever you hung out with my man. See, that's my thing that I, do, I won't do is if I, I, f- I feel like if I have a if I have a heart, like I had a real rough week partying in New York. Uh, I, th- I might have done drugs. I'm not certain. I was pretty blacked out one night. And I don't, I don't ever black out, but I was definitely blacked out. And I saw someone else do drugs, and I, he doesn't do drugs at all, at all. I saw two people do drugs that don't do drugs, and I went, I just, I remember giggling at it, and then I woke up and I was like, I think I fucking did drugs last night, and I was shaky, like shaky. And then I went in, I did Jim and Sam, and I had a big cup of coffee, and then me and Sam went to go see Planet of the Apes, the new one. And I went home and I was like, fuck, man, I, I I can't operate. But I won't take a Xanax to chill out and just go to bed because I feel like, hey, man, if you're going to dig these graves, you got to live in them. Like, you, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? No, no, no. I might. You got to pay the piper. You can't fucking. I'm punitive about that. Like this morning I woke up. I did a podcast with, uh, you know, Adam Rant and uh, Brad Williams. And we got pretty fucking lit. Adam Ray smoked. Adam Ray spoke two joints just by himself, just by himself. I told him you and Adam, you and Adam would get down. I think both home, like he's a big weed guy. But we stayed up until like midnight. I go to sleep at like two. I wake up at seven. I have a call back for a voiceover, and I go, I'm punitive. I go, Nah, man, you're not allowed to be that party guy and not work out. So I get on the treadmill and I run. Two really hard miles. I walked one intermittently and then ran two really hard miles. And I was like, fuck it, here we go. And then I, I, I got to get sweating. I get in the shower. I keep, I get in real hot showers. So I keep sweating. I get out of the shower. I let myself keep sweating to get all the impurities out. And then I rolled into the voiceover and I felt really good. I felt fantastic. Girl said, how are you, how are you doing today? I said, probably the best I've been in a while. I love that feeling. I got in the new car, drove the new car. Oh. It was a fucking great morning. And then I went down to All Things Comedy, shot some promos, came home, had dinner. I'm here. But I didn't feel so good this morning. <laughs> you just got to punish yourself. Don't be, don't go American with it. Punish yourself. Don't say, I'm going to tap out and take a Xanax. Say, I'm getting on the treadmill. Or, I'm going to do kettlebells. Or I'm going to go to jujitsu. I'm going to do, you said it today. I'm do, I smoked all that uh, all that joint. I'm doing two sessions of yeah, jujitsu tomorrow. To 12. If you're not punitive, I don't think you succeed. When I was about 14, I started getting popular, you know. My freshman year, I started fucking around and seeing other people. At first, I just stood in my neighborhood. I remember, my, my hometown is really big. There's seven grammar schools. I kept in my own grammar school. But after a while, you stretch out into other territories and you yeah. meet kids. And ah, that was the fun time. Those are the fun times. God. And, I went there and I hung out with these kids that had older brothers, and their older brothers were the shit. Yeah. So whenever they had parties, it bought me a pass to go into those parties. Oh. So it's probably my freshman year, like April. It's not hot yet, but it's not cold yet. They yeah. lived maybe three quarters of a mile from my house. And the beauty about this family, when my mother died, they asked me if I wanted to live with them. And I really didn't know them that well, and I thanked them. But they had a shed. And the the one that was my age, you we would get together five nights a week in the shed. No heat, yeah, no heat. New Jersey, <laughs> November, you come over, we smoke twenty five joints, but they ain't no heat. Yeah. A lot of nights we spent out there, but it was one of those nights. And he called me up. He goes, "My brother's having one of his fucking crazy parties. It's only going to be me, you, and Conti that are invited from our age group don't say nothing they just don't want no younger kids there yeah you know and I went expecting to get abused a little bit that's what you do when you're a sophomore and you're in a room with seniors yeah especially after they won the state championship in football and they're all fucking yoked and you know so I go down there and a matter of fact that wasn't what it was they were very nice to me but these guys weren't druggies they were fucking crazy white boozers so what they did was they would do things None of the, nobody else did at parties. Like, and that's what I loved about them. Like this particular party, they just went shopping and bought every fucking flavor of booze they can. And they took a garbage can and they put a baggie in it and they just filled it up with fucking booze, ice cubes, and fruit. 
Oh. It made a hunch punch. It tasted like <laughs> garbage, but they also went and killed the hundred bees and threw them in the punch. What? To flavor the food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything with these guys <laughs> was pure savagery. One time, they had a Christmas party, and I walked in, and there was a table, and they were breaking glass on the table, and they were eating glass at a party. <laughs> they were fucking nuts. They were nuts, and that's why I liked them. Yo, they see. Wait, they kill <laughs> oh, they went hunting for bees and sprinkled and cut their heads off, or cut the stingers off, and threw them all in this fucking... <laughs> so you didn't know what the fuck you were drinking in there. They threw mask in there, oh. you know, but you didn't know till you get there. <laughs> I'm fucking 14. You know, like I said, I'm a pot smoker. At that time, I did a little mescaline. Oh my God. I had done angel dust maybe once or twice. Oh. I'm not a professional. I love that they killed 100 bees. They went bee hunting. I don't even know where you find bees. Me neither. I don't In a hive. Yeah, but then how do you get them to be they dead? They went, they killed them, and then they cut their fucking stingers off. Oh. And they threw them into this punch. And me, Stinky, Please and don't. Avillo go to this oh. party. And I don't know nothing about nothing. <laughs> They're pouring it with the ladle into your oh. glass. Oh. And there's one guy that would come up <laughs> to you. There's one guy that would come up to you and just punch in the chest every time. Ba boom and say, Let me see that fucking glass. It's an empty oh. youngster. I mean, he would just cave your chest. Do you so, know that in this story, I see a punched up version of your album cover? Do you ever see, jo you know, no, Joey's no. album cover of, like, I, all I see is like a little bit bigger version of that kid. So, here you go. That kid, that is my favorite picture of you, Joey. Oh, that kid picture? That, that, can you pull that up real quick so I can see it? The Savage Dad? No, L the no, picture the, of me dancing. Uh, oh, the yeah. documentary. Uh, uh, Splack those hams. What did your mom say? Splack those. What, uh, Dali man, Hamon. Look, Dali I, Hamon. Dali Hamon. That when there's a part of you that I don't think everyone knows about me, but before I even met you, I was on the road doing Travel Channel, and I become a fan of Rogan's podcast. And I and I I knew Tommy, I knew Ari a little bit, and I, I kind of knew Red Band, and I didn't know you at all. But you guys were my favorite ones to listen to, and so I would put you guys on in the bed next to me, in in the bed on my iPad, and I just let it play because I had anxiety on the road because I was doing crazy shit, and I was like, oh, it's like my my friends were in the other room, and I'm home. Although even and this sounds so crazy, but not to anyone listening because you know what you're saying, you know what I'm saying, but like. Even though I wasn't even didn't even know you, I still felt like my friends were in the other room. I didn't even know Joe at the time, but I still felt like my friends were in the other room. I love that fucking picture. That is where I where where I get my balls from. That is my favorite. That is such a great you know, fucking picture. If I tell you something, guys, let me tell you the fucking story behind this picture. That is my such mom a great came fucking from, picture. My mom came from Dick, guys. It was nine kids and two parents in a bedroom. And my uncle told me that they used to fucking, uh, look at the bracelet. The yeah. bracelet in those days was two of these. It was two of these. Really? Cut. So you see it's a double bracelet, but let me tell you the story behind this, guys. Just to show you, I think on Rogan one time I said immigrant mentality and people always make fun of me and shit. My mom grew up in this thing, and what my mom told me one time is that since they were so poor, they didn't celebrate birthdays, and it always bothered my mother. But the mother likes it. Like, my grandmother yeah. believed in it, but my grandfather didn't because they were so poor. They didn't want them. He couldn't give them a gift, so he wouldn't celebrate that birthday. So my mother always swore that if she ever had a family on... Um, that kid's or daughter's birthday, she would lose her fucking mind. My mom would work hard all fucking year to wait for this. My mom's big season was from December 17th to January 7th. If I brought you to the bar from December 17th to January 7th, if you were 13 or 12, yeah. and you came in and acted cute in front of my mom, my mom would give you 50 bucks. And say, and, and so now you like my mom, whatever. But that's not the point. Yeah. The point is, every year she would hire the photographer from the New York City newspaper, the Spanish newspaper, Diario La Prensa. And this guy would come to my mother's bar from the age of three that I came from Cuba. And every February 19th, that whole week, my mom would take those suits, a tailor made. Really? She would tailor make those, two of them. I'd have a morning party 
and a night party. You ready? This is what Burke Kreischer would have fell right into my family. The morning party was children. Children under 12. Children under 18. They came. There was ham. There was bocaditos, little nice sandwiches. Ham, uh, deviled ham, Cuban style. Oh, uh, white bread. Have you ever had that yes, shit? Yes, fuck Lee, yeah, I have. That's what else I gotta show you, <laughs> Lee. When I show you this, you might be saying, "I, I was gonna go to Boston to visit my mother, but me and Paul are gonna go to Miami now. I can't take it no more." Fuck. Listen, dude. bocalitos are like fucking ten cents a piece. It's on Wonder Bread, Lee. It's it's deviled ham, Cuban style. On Wonder Bread, they cut the edges off, Lee. Once you bite into it. You're done. So I'm not getting anything until I get a pepperata. That that thing. A pepperata. So uh, you see that? That's ham. There's bocaditos. So here's where it gets interesting. I see the happy birthday in the back. This, this the, is this on is the, on, this on the board. Oh shit! This is oh, this is this is the daytime party. <laughs> My mother's big highlight was in the daytime party. There was a pinata, and when you pulled the string, it was for kids. Yeah, and there would be like candies and stuff, but there would also be like twenty dollar bills for the kids. What? And there was an adult pinata. That's when all the kids went home, and then the parents came. I'd come out with a different suit. The parents, <laughs> no, my mother was a spec. I would listen. Love, I would. My mother love was a spec. To party with your mom. You have yeah. no idea. My mother was a spec spec. You know what a spec spec is? She took it to the yes. that that I had that bracelet on by the time I was two. Oh like, I had a man's sick. bracelet on when I was two. For the adult party, she would put little aluminum foils with cocaine in them for the adults and put them in the pinata. And oh. at 9.30, they pulled the string, and all these adults would be on the floor looking for cocaine and shit. Oh. And she would take me and go, go in there, get in there, and mix it up with those, and pick up all the aluminum foils that you see for mommy. And I remember I knew what was in from those mommy. foils. I knew what was in those foils. I may believe I didn't yeah. know what was in those foils. I haven't heard the term spick in so long. Oh yeah, it's in these Coast. Like that was that was growing up in high school. That was and I and I say this like and I'm sure there's there's no one PC listening to this podcast. No. But like well, growing up that's what we call like that was it was just like a term of endearment. Well, when the Spicks came out, you, you're from where? Tampa. Yeah. So Spicks, all we're all Cuban. Jesus Christ, we got to deal with these Spicks on the other side of town now. <laughs> What's the name of the town? Uh, I, I remember I remember they're going, uh, uh, oh my gosh. What it, like, I remember going up to a lunch table and go, uh, oh, hey, can you Spicks scoot over? Spicks was like, a, it was a great nickname. I'm sure it was offensive to guys that, you know, like it's of an older very generation. Offensive. Of a Spanish older generation. People? Very offensive. You know what it stands for? Yes. It's, well, I thought so. What? Isn't it just for Spanish people? No, you, it, there's SPIC is a acronym. Oh, okay. I, don't, I think I heard Spanish it Spanish people in our country. Oh, my God. Spanish people in command, bitch. In command. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Take to the part of the documentary where Carmine Balzano says it. When I, was, I love that picture. Though. So, wait, is this a, a morning party or a night party? That was the morning party. Oh. See the kids in the back. Do you remember that picture at all? Yeah, so listen, my mom would take them and put them in albums. She'd take them. So when I was, the last party she had for me was when I was 14. So she had basically 11 albums from this country. Yeah. From those parties. They were wrapped, they were thick, and they went from the beginning, me walking into the bar on the ice February 19th, to all the way to. I could look at, I could, I could literally. Uh, can I, can, can I, man. You know, Sigur and I were talking about you the other day, behind your back in the best possible way. You were so funny on Rogan, and you weren't you weren't trying at all. That there's a thing about your personality that that is it's almost like the the top of the mountain when it comes to like guys like me and Sigur who found our voices on podcasting. But like you are so in the moment, you could tell a story better for the first time than I could tell a story better working on it for four years does that make sense and i'd even say that about you like you telling a story for the first time has such a genuine energy and we were like god man like thank god a medium like this came i'll say this for me thank god a medium like this came along for me me too because but me and you me and you and like miss pat like so no, we, people, we, uh, we would have been dead without this medium right now. Fuck, I would have been dead. I said to dead, my, I dead, said to my dead, agent, dead. or I said to my agent, maybe or someone. Or they were, or we were talking about um, about social media, and they're like, "Well, you've really blown up on podcasting." And I said, 
Yeah, but I think podcasting from and I use me and you interchangeably only because because I think it's done really good things for our careers. But I go, I know ten people. It's done great things for that career. Yeah. I can hit ten people who are doing tremendously different, who started podcasting, took them a while to get it going. Yeah. And once you pick up the momentum and it's just being honest, being consistent. The, the phonies get faded out of podcasting very quickly. Very quickly. And they'll keep you, fading you, out. You'll see them. They were in the first they were in the first run of Rogan when Rogan was like, Let's have this guy on. And then he's just like, I'll never have that guy on again. It's tough talking to a guy who doesn't know who he is. Like it, I, I'm, I'm not ta- I, look now I'm starting to get buzzed, but like I'm not I'm not talking shit, but I'm just saying like you'll see the guys that don't do podcasts, their acts are a little bit like uh, inflated. It's not really who they are. They are they're not all true, you know. But the guys that podcast, it's just people who would have had a hard time being phony in Hollywood, but can be very genuine in those moments. And I was saying to someone, I was saying, you know, Twitter blew up. A, there was a guy, I forget his name. I'm Rob Delaney. Right. It was a guy that blew up on Twitter. It was because Rob Delaney is a great writer. He's a really smart guy. He's a really he's got his shit together. And in 160 characters, he can write the best joke you're going to see in a while. Jenny High Five Johnson, um, uh, Kelly Oxford, all these people were really smart, really great at like c- conciseness of words. And then podcasting showed up, and guys like me and you were like, I mean, I'll st- to this day, the hardest I've ever laughed on a podcast ever was when you, when me, you, Steve Renazizi, Rogan, were all sitting at that table, and in the Ice House Chronicles, and you're like, dog, you ever break into a house, there's a chick's house on a quail who need her pussy? And, you know, that doesn't work on Twitter. <laughs> but the way you did it... Then all of a sudden you go, oh, this is my new best friend. This is the person I want to be around a lot. When you said um, blue cheese with or over ranch or go fuck your mother, like th- those things, they don't fit on. They, that doesn't make sense on Twitter where you can take things out of context. But in a world where you like to be in context, like I like being in context, and that's where it's like when I, I said spick earlier. You, if you take that out of context, I sound like a really horrible person. But but. I'm not a bad person. I'm telling you a story about my life, about interacting with all Cuban kids growing up, and the word "spick" being interchangeable for "buddy" or "that guy," or you know. So well, I'm sure you threw those spicks off the table. <laughs> they were your buddies. You know, Dude, spicks taught me how to fucking tell tell a story. Fuck, you sit with a group. You sit with a, ki- a table of Cuban kids. And you and you're the, and now I'm not saying like I'm the white kid like I was underprivileged. It was a, it was a private school, but like you sit down with a table of Cuban kids, all their dads have big personalities. All them have big personalities. There wasn't like a, I, I don't remember one quiet Cuban kid growing up. Ty Rodriguez, I mean that motherfucker made me laugh harder than anyone's ever made me laugh. When we were in uh, Mr. Mercandante's um, religion class, Ty Rodriguez sat behind me. And uh, Mr. Mercandante said, uh, when Jesus was at the top of the cross, he called Peter to his feet. He said something to Peter. Do you know what he said to Peter? Mr. Kreischer, what did he say to Peter? Like trying to stump me. I don't know what he fucking said to Peter. And Ty Rodriguez leaned up behind me in my ear and he goes, he said, I can see your house from here. (laughs) And I fucking died laughing. But my personality was developed around guys like that. Like that's, that's, you know. I'm going to tell you something, and I'm going to be as honest as I can with you. They, listen, there's a lot of mediums where people excel. And they excel for different reasons. And I believe in one thing. I believe in hard work. I believe in dedication. And I believe in commitment. But I also believe in father time. You know, uh, they've been pushing McGregor all week. Yeah. All week, if you watch uh, 218, uh, FX1, FX Sports. <laughs> the channel number. 618, uh, whatever, Spy, whatever. Mm-hmm. They've been showing main... Like, what's the number for? They have all these different UFC shows, but it's all wrapped up around McGregor, which I, I, I can understand. Like, i tell you what movie they've been playing all week since that thing happened in Charlottesville. A Time to Kill. With Sandra Bullock... And mm-hmm. some network has had it on 24 hours since that thing. Yeah. But they showed the first McGregor uh, Diaz fight, okay? And I'll never forget, I'm no fucking genius. I was backstage with Joe, 
I heard Joe talking with fucking Cameron Haynes and about a bunch of people. And I'm sitting there going, man, the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Hardest thing I've ever, ever done in my life is fucking jujitsu training. Yeah. And I've done a lot of things. I worked on roofs. I was a fucking, uh, what do you call those people who carry bricks? Whatever the fuck. Mason. Hard carriers. Brick carriers. Hard carriers. carriers. <laughs> that shit's hard. And okay, I started when I was 50. And I thought about doing it for 15 years and being a black belt. And I thought about what he had said at one of the things that he, you know, he, he didn't even like jujitsu, Nate. The only reason why he would go is because he knew the guys would buy him a, a burrito. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the thing. So I'm starting to think, I'm going, wait a second, six, seven hours a day of rolling for 12, 15 years. You know what I'd be doing to people? Yeah. Do you have any fucking idea? Once I grabbed your wrist, it'd be night, night. They would tell you, if Joey Diaz grabs your wrist, just tap. Yeah. Because I'd pull you down and choke you the fuck out. And that's what I'm experience. That's the only reason I bet the amount of money I did on Diaz in the first fight. Yeah. Because I believe in experience. When this podcasting game came in, I was up the corner peeing in a bottle. At Ford dealership? Yeah. I went in there to pee in a bottle for looking for a job. Really? I was done. I was done. Oh, you were the fuck. I done. You were the first guy that was good at it. I was done. And no, we talked about this the other night. Monday night, we spoke about me. Felicia and I started a podcast, and we we were lost. We were like in that. Felicia in the, and you, Felicia and you were lost when you started this. But no, but you on Rogan. What was what was it? No, 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 no. But listen, when I started with Felicia, we were lost. We were two people talking every Tuesday. We got a couple downloads, but like I told Lee the other day, there were these things that covered our faces, these circles. Pop so you, filters. So yeah. you can't spit. So I couldn't really see her, and she couldn't really see me. And one night she said something. One afternoon she said something. And I told her, I go, you know, one night I was in the city, and me and my buddies went out to get blown over at a bar, and right by 42nd Street in the uh, mid-'80s, there was a pretzel thing. If you went into, if you took the Lincoln Tunnel back to Jersey, yeah. you could stop and get a pretzel there. But if you didn't make that left and you went straight and made a right, that whole street was hookers. And the little pimp was a, a dude, a black dude, that may believe he was retarded in a wheelchair. <laughs> but he had like two machine guns and there was two other retarded black oh, dudes in wheelchairs. Oh, what a And cover. you would drive down that block and there'd be fucking 20 black chicks, the cops were in on it, and you'd get in the car. And they'd suck your dick around the world or sex. This is eighty two, no condoms. I remember I remember yeah. what around the world means. Yeah, and around the world. <laughs> uh, Wait, it, I thought around the world was sex, no? Around the world's around the world. Everything. They eat your everything. assholes. Yeah. They suck your balls, you fuck them, they blow you. It's the whole thing for like thirty five dollars Lee. Oh Jesus. It's nineteen eighty two. No condom? No condom Lee. In, the, in the backseat of a car. On your back, eating that ass, and she, and the last time guy she fucked, she. And remember, there was no handy wipes then. <laughs> there was no chlorine snaps. They took they took like water from a hose and washed their pussy and mm. went back. Water from a hose, like it's a fucking, fucking crazy leak, like a workman trying to get. But a anyway, drink. it really doesn't matter, Bert. We're telling oh, the shit. we're telling the story, and I'll never forget talking about how I got in the car, and I'm I'm committed. You're absolutely right, Bert. You were absolutely right because you're a comic and you understand. I'm looking at this mic and I'm telling this story like I'm there. We all get in the car and the, the, the hook is saying, where are we going? And my buddy's going, <laughs> take her back to Jersey. Take her back to Jersey. And she's going, I can't go to Jersey. And, and we're like, shut the fuck up. And the next thing you know, she goes in the purse and she takes a, a straight razor out and she goes to cut. The driver and my friend punches her in the face. I don't know what to do, Bert. I just grab her by the hair, but when I pull, it's a wig. So we take the knife from her hand. All of a sudden, punches start coming from everywhere. My three buddies are just throwing lefts and rights at this poor hooker. We take her to the Lincoln fucking tunnel. We take her into North Bergen, into Fairview, New Jersey, into a cemetery. It's Allegedly. Two in the Allegedly. It's two in the fucking... It happened in 82. You can't prove this shit. You're saying it, though. Right. We take her into this fucking cemetery. We take her out of the car, and we go, fucking give us the fucking money. Oh, my God. We were going to rob her. The point of, right then and there, I look over <laughs> at Felicia, and Felicia is like this, Bert Kreischer. 
What do you expect? And I busted out and laughed, her, and that's when I knew right there. Mm. Right there. Now, I did that on a Tuesday. Yeah. Okay? The podcast got released on a Thursday. I had a show at... Who's on Melrose now fighting for his life doing comedy? Sal. Sal's Comedy Hall was on La Brea. Sal's Comedy Hall had just left New York City. He wanted to expand his operations. He had one in New York City in the village that was very hot. And now he was expanding his operations to L.A. and he had one on La Brea. I had booked a room, percentage deal. He calls me up and he goes, hey, where are you? I go, I'm on the 101. He goes, hurry up. We've got 100 people here. Really? I go, here we go. Another guy telling me to hurry up. I get there and there's 10 people. He goes, no. You got 118 people paid. Yeah. $10 to see you. And that was the beginning. Dude, I remember when we did my very first podcast. And Lee is going to help me get all those back up. But you have to, I should, I need to tell everyone that. Just to, to turn off, download all. That's all. Just yeah. download only new, the new ones, not the old ones. But, uh. When I did my first podcast with you, you told a story about uh, I, 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 I took it out. My dad, my dad called me. He goes, "Buddy, we all had a couple cocktails." Joey said some stuff he may not want out there, and I go, "Dad, Joey is not, never say like anything that Joey says. He's cool with saying." And my dad goes, "No, buddy, you got to take these things out. I just think they incriminate Joey." <laughs> So there's like three things I took. I should re-release that original podcast yeah. in its entirety. But I, my dad made me take it around. He goes, hey, you don't want to be associated with this. It's a, it's really bad crimes. Oh, my God. And I was like, Dad, I go, Dad, Joey's in prison. And he was like, oh, he doesn't want that mentioned. That could really hurt his resume. I was like, Dad, Joey is who he is. That's why we love him. And he was like. Listen, it's why we love him. But I just don't. You don't know who's going to listen to this. You know what if what if uh, what if NBC listens to this and they want to hire for Joey for something? You don't want to be the reason Joey didn't get the job. I was like, Dad, you need to listen to more Joey. And then cut to the next time you meet him, you gave him marijuana. <laughs> and my dad's like, release the entire thing, <laughs> release the kraken. There's things that Joey would say that he says to me on the phone. That are worse than the Donald Sterling tapes. Like all, like all when when that was happening, I was, we would just laugh. Because if I ever recorded anything, like, but like it wouldn't even oh. be bad for you. You just said everything. I think that if Lee tape recorded me, <laughs> and re he could release this album, I really think so. Because there's times I get off the phone with Lee, and we're both fucking howling. <laughs> I'm funny in Spanish. I'm funny in English. I'm funny when I tell a story. But when I'm on a row, it's when I'm on a phone call with somebody, and we start talking about shit. We go, Lee and I go. Well, I started, I started like for my when I was doing that long, not a long time ago, but a, like a couple years ago, I was doing a vlog. And if you called, I would throw the camera on. And your rant, that first, that five minute rant you give someone when you talk to them, oh yeah, what's up, Tarzan? Like, and I would always put them in there and go. I know you're cool with it. Like I like you and Segura. If you guys call me and I and I'm on a I'm on a radio show or whatever, I go. It's they're so fun. You guys are so funny in the moment, regardless of whether or not you're being recorded or not. I'm, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna announce this right now. I'm quitting comedy <laughs> at the end of 2018. I'm quitting podcasting, and I'm gonna open up a service. I still have to figure out a price. <laughs> <clears throat> Where I call you five days a week between oh. 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. Oh my god, and I was I the just, guinea pig for this. Now course. you're gonna get a three. No, 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 no. I'm not even giving, giving you three days. You're gonna get nothing. You have to pay for everything in my world. You guys, I proved to you what I could do in the morning. Listen to me. If you have problems, uh, if you have physical problems or emotional problems <laughs> or drug problems or you're a little lazy. I'm your last fucking line of defense. I like this, Joey. Okay? It's going to be a 90-day program. And I'm going to call you up five days a week. And guess what? If you don't answer, I'm going to get the paperwork signed that I send a cop to your fucking house until you do answer. No, I like so, this. Oh, no, no. I, I really if, went to an attorney. If it doesn't, if they don't people, answer, they, they get charged double. These people who think that a motivational uh, a can, uh, calendar is going to help you because you guys don't understand what it is to be down. You guys don't understand what it is to wake up in a rocket ship with a jacket on, like under a rocket ship, like at a park. Oh. And 
<laughs> I thought I, David Bowie was taking no, over. No, 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 no. You, you wake up on a rocket ship. Was Joey an astronaut? And you uh, <laughs> have no money. You have a coke addiction. You know, you have to dress. I would go to my buddy's dress, break into his back window, take oh a shower, God. take a sweatshirt, do laundry, eat some breakfast, and then my day would begin. But what kept me going was the things I used to say to myself when I was laying there. Yeah. Which is the things I said to myself when I was here in L.A. in the beginning. It's 9 in the morning. You can sit in this apartment and do what every other comic does, make believe he's writing and bitch about how nothing's working for him. That's a percentage. Oh, yeah. Or you could get yourself up, you fat sack of shit. I mean, what are you gonna do with your? I love it. I love what are you gonna do with your felonious fucking life? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna yeah. do? You gonna impress me with your felonious life? Listen, you got parents, you got people that love you and people that care for you, and you don't want to get up because your pussy hurts or so you're fucking feel, a little shaky. You're starting you're this over. shit with the depression. Oh. This shit ends now. This is Uncle Joey telling you to get the fuck up, and, and you got to do something. When you get to the fucking destination you have to go to, or when you get to that gym, I want you to call me from there and leave a fucking message. It better come up over my fucking phone that it's coming from you. I'm not even going to answer the phone. I just want to make sure you get the way you're going. You know I love you. I'm sorry I had to talk to you this way. <laughs> have a phenomenal day, you bad motherfucker. If I don't love you, Jesus does, and just hang up on you. Why can't you? You should. You should That's start. It. That's a you service. You should start a version of that right that now. That is the business. No, no. I got to think. Of, I got to get the attorneys. I already wrote it out. Lee I and love I, that. I Lee love and I that. get high and talk about business plans. I said, you know what? I'm going to narrow this down. Lee's come to me with calendars. Somebody else came to me with T-shirts. The, the, the thing is, the call in the morning telling you that you're a fucking sack of shit, <laughs> that the world owes you nothing. You're not special. Your mother and father lied to you just like they lied to me. And one day we all come to the conclusion that nobody's going to give you dick, you miserable fuck. Get up, go shampoo, make some coffee. I want you to wash your hair. I want you to comb it. I want you to put on a white fucking shirt. I want you to fill well, it was a black shirt. That's ready. We'll go in the fucking washer. Yeah. Take the white shirt out, iron it, put cologne on it. I'm not going to narrow it on nationalities, but people do it all the time. And wear that shirt the second <laughs> and third day. I'm not <laughs> gonna... <laughs> you know, there would be a lot of people that No, be... it's true, because people need... You, listen, it's the same shit your dad tells you. Oh my God. Only a broken record. Only someday. Is there like a nice version for people who like? There's no the, the, the world. Shit part of listen the to me. The world ain't nice, Lee. <laughs> the world ain't nice. There's a guy that's coming in to apply for the same job as you. You have no high school education, and you want to take off the weekend and go see the the state fair to go see ZZ Top. Well, there's a Mexican who just came in, and he said he'll do your job for seven fifty an hour. And you're getting 10. Guess what's going to happen when you get back from your ZZ Top <laughs> concert? You're going to get fired. This you're is the me. shit I prevent you from doing. Absolutely. You, there's no concerts. There's no nothing. I want your bank statements. I want what you owe. So the torture that you've given me over the years, you're going to just Yeah, there's no it. reason to go on vacation. Look at your... <laughs> your life's turned around, Lee. Go look, go no, it's, look, it's great. I'm just Go saying, look at your up. fucking visa bill and tell me if you got time to take your fucking wife on vacation. Look at that. <laughs> Just ask me one more time. Go ahead. You, who the fuck are you to go on vacation four times in one year? Oh. You barely made 42000 last year. Who the fuck are you, Donald <laughs> DeLorentis? My dad, my dad. You sound like my dad right now. I remember on my birthday, my 26th birthday, I oh, wasn't doing Laurentiis. stand-up, and I was, uh, I, was, I was just fucking partying in New York. And he called me in the morning, and I said, uh, I answered the phone because I thought he was going to wish me happy birthday, and I could go back to bed. So I was hungover. And I was like, hello. And he's like, you're a piece of shit. And I was like, uh, dad? And he was like, I perjured myself in court today. The judge asked how you were doing. I was under oath and I said, you're doing great. He was I lied about you because you're such a piece of shit. I was like, uh, you know, it's my birthday, right? And he goes, you don't deserve a birthday. And I was like, w I go, I remember he, he gave me a great speech that I, I'm very grateful I got. Because it changed the direction of my life. But at the same time, at the very end of the speech, I said, he goes, you go to that comedy club and you tell them you'll work for 25. You'll work for free. I ended up getting 25 bucks a night. He goes, you'll work for free and do whatever they want you to do. I said, Dad, but I have a party tonight. And he goes, you don't deserve a party. He goes, you go to that club. If you let this be your party, let work be your party. 
let earning it's something be your party. It's the truth. And it was, it's, it's such an amazing it's it's, fucking it's, truth. Yeah. I was a, a hipster way before hipsters and millennials. I believed I was in privilege. I was like, I deserve things. I didn't deserve shit. There was a guy that was willing to do it before me, and then that guy would get it. And I just, and th- that that night, that conversation on my 26th birthday changed my life. There's a dude, Matt Woods, I think about every week. Not the biggest guy in the world, not the toughest guy in the world, just a guy from Long Island who wrote for Roseanne. And he was a very decent guy. And I tell this story fucking, I think about him all the time. I look him up on Facebook because without him, Papa wouldn't be here. Yeah. After like two years in comedy one night, he came up to me after an open mic, Burt Kreischer. Not to this Joe Diaz. He went up to crazy Joe Diaz <laughs> in 94 when I was going through a divorce. Yeah, I had no money. They, she wouldn't let me see the kid. The anger was spewing out of me. And he oh. caught me on the way out after I had just killed. Open mic three minutes on a Tuesday for me in those days. I'd go up there with no material. Yeah. Yo, by the way, you could still go up there with no material. <laughs> I got on stage. Yeah. Before I was leaving, he pulled me aside. He was like, don't for a second. Because he had a writing class that was free on Tuesday before the open mic. So if you went to his house, he'd feed you a bunch of comics, girls, guys, and he would sit with you, ask you what you were working on, and he would do this. The Comedy Works paid him. Yeah. It was called the Comedy Works Development Plan. And Wendy, till this day, I give her props because a lot of good comics came from that camp. Are you cool with Wendy now? I'm cool. Than I'm, I'm going there for the first time Sunday night. She's tremendous. Sunday, I'm doing Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. She's tr- that's who invented that. It was Wendy Curtis. Really? When I first started comedy, her lineup for the week would be, at that time, Jackie Flynn was on fucking fire. Jackie Flynn from Boston? And Boston was the hottest comic in the country. Really? He had just won the San Francisco comedy competition. I, I'll never forget the other comic that was very hot at that time, 1994, was Felicia Michaels. I, I will say this. I have to say this in all, in, in like, just to, to put it out there. I still think Felicia Michaels is gorgeous. Oh, she's still looking good, but no, no, no. She's gorgeous. And I think about, she's hilarious, but I'm just saying, like, like I, 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 I have to say that because every time we all hung out, cause me, and you, me and Felicia did a podcast, like, I think three times. Every time I was like, dude, she's still a diamond in my book. She still looks fucking good. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And she's a savage. Yeah. She she's just, great. Yeah, she yeah, She just yeah. hides it. But it was like in those days she would have, Wendy would book Bobby Collins, who was on fire. He had the search commercial. I remember, no, Bobby Collins. Okay. I was worked with uh, Louis C.K. in Fort Lauderdale and when Georgia was born in 2004. And Bobby Collins rolled in. And I, the man... I've never seen. I mean, Louis uh, was a big guy to me, but man, he paid Bobby Collins massive respect. Like, was so grateful that he came in. Yeah, Thank no, yeah. Bobby's a good dude, man. And Bobby Collins would come in Monday, Tuesday. Then Felicia Michaels would come in Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. He'd have, she'd have Jackie Flynn. Jackie I'll never Flynn. forget who the hottest comic was in the country when I got into comedy. You ready? Yeah. Who's the guy Greg Garcia had on that show? From Boston. What's the show before My Name is Earl he had? Was it Raising Arizona? Was it? No. I don't know. Uh, Anthony Clark. Anthony Clark. When I got into comedy, Anthony Clark was the fucking comic to watch. Dude, he, he was tremendous at that time. What happened to him? He moved out to L.A. and he became a television star. No, but like he, what happened to him? Like, I haven't seen him in a while. Well, he was a fun guy to party I, with. He pissed off some people, like we usually do when we have three dollars. Well, now we think we know everything about the world. Yeah, you know, some people turn against you, and then that works. You know? I heard a story about him. By the way, this is uh, allegedly right. Is that how we protect ourselves? Yeah, he, absolutely. But this isn't bad. But uh, it's legal. When he got on Boston Commons, I think was the first show he did. It's like a big show. Yes, he did Boston Commons. He was in Boston at the time, or or uh, or Seattle or L.A. But his his brother connected with a bunch of guys who were starting a company, and they're like, "You should really invest in our company. You have a little extra cash. Throw some in." So he did, and that company was Microsoft. And I heard he is paid in full for the rest of his life. 
You never look at They say Dice was one of the original investors of Starbucks. Really? Ooh. Think of when Dice got hot. Right when Starbucks yeah. was starting. That's the rumor. Oh, who knows? I never met Dice. I met, I, met, I met Dice. I've actually worked with Dice, but I don't know Dice. But I find him fascinating. Very fascinating. And when you hear his story of how he started, how his, he wasn't even 18, and he started as a Travolta impersonator. Yeah. And he would go to these mafia parties, and they would pay him 200 to do Travolta, and, you know, it goes on and on. I mean, you sit there and go, Jesus fucking Christ. And that was my point. The podcasting, it's not like we're good at podcasting. It's that I paid my dues as a comic. What? Yeah. And then I became a storyteller later on. And I figured my niche out. My niche wasn't going up there and telling you that her pussy stunk like a fish or my dick or that I yeah. ate her ass. That was nothing to do with it. My comedy was about what was in front of me, which was what was my life. Well, I mean, personally, I think comedians can be are the best podcasters, but there's a lot of comedians. We've had them as guests. And they have their own podcasts that are they can be the worst podcasters too. Like but can I can I jump in and absolutely. say that like so like someone I thought and by the way I hope this doesn't sound like I'm talking shit. I hope this everyone sees that this is coming with love. <laughs> but like like I the someone I thought that would be bad at podcasting would be Paulie because because Paulie was a movie star like in the eighties. So like and there's such a like a, a an ingrained indoctrined like um don't share too much, you know, type of thing. And then I saw him on Rogan, and I got really excited because I've always been a fan of Paulie's, you know, from when I was, I mean, he was a movie star when I was in high school, so, like, I watched every one of his fucking movies. And I know there's a part of Paulie that's deeper than what maybe the public thinks. So I saw him on Rogan, and uh, it was maybe one of my favorite Rogan appearances I've ever seen. And they start by talking about your appearance with him here. We, don't talk, we don't talk about Paulie on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys post the video yet? No. Are you serious? Because I would love to see that fucking, I would love to see that. It was such a great Rogan appearance that I was like, that's what I love about podcasting, I think is him being vulnerable. I think it's better that the Rogan appearance is the one that's out there. Really? Yeah. What's, what's, Did you air the what's, what's audio? The, what's the movie that somebody says that we don't talk about him here? Voldemort? Uh -huh. With Harry Potter, he who must not be named? No, no, I we, we, we don't talk about him. Here. You watch Harry Potter. I guess. Who you call him? Fuck, I'm calling Paulie Shaw direct. <laughs> for, for the of shit. You know. I wonder if he knows who I am. Doesn't matter. You don't need to know nobody. No names. <laughs> oh my god. Let's leave him a message and shit. Maybe, maybe, oh, maybe, 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 maybe not give it over. Hey, put on a speaker, Joey. Paulie Shaw, Joe Diaz. All of a sudden, you get on the Rogan podcast. You forget about me and shit, cocksucker. <laughs> All of a sudden, you're a star. You got in Encino Man 3. You know, <laughs> you don't want to talk to me no more. Call me back. I miss you. I love you. We just on the podcast live, and we were talking about you, your appearance on Rogue and how great you were and shit. You showed up here with flip-flops on, looking all fucked up, but I love you. I'm thinking about you. Call me back. Stay black. Oh, my God. I can't wait. Do you have that audio? Can we? Can it? Can it be something given to friends that we can personally listen to on airplanes? No, 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 no. no, no, no. It's, in a, it's in the deep, deep, you deep. Know, deep. Man, can we? Can we? Can we? Can we? Can we give like the the me angel me, share of podcasters? Tell you what the truth about podcasting is. There's 50 comics out there. Yeah. And we've had comics on here who we thought were gonna come on here and blow the roof off, yeah. and they've been duds. And then we brought regular people on here who've done sensational. There's a line in your life. And if you're not willing to go through that line, you're dead in podcasting. That's the one, guys. Then there's the guys that come on and look down on you. And they look at you and they go, I've been on radio for 22 years. Well, let me explain something to you, Mr. Fucking Dinosaur Man. <laughs> All right, Mr. Kleptosaurus, whatever the fuck they are with the little hands. What's the guy with the little hands? T-Rex? T-Rex, whatever. Kleptosaurus. What the fuck that That's the dinosaur is. that stole from other dinosaurs. Well, let me tell you something. I feel fucked. like that was your name when you were stealing. That's why radio's dead, because you're still using the phony voice, and you're still... 
that's that's not what people are looking for. Yeah. They're looking for a real and honest conversation. It, it's from eavesdropping. The fucking heart. It's eavesdropping. That's exactly what this is. <laughs> it's two people, three people talking shit, smoking dope, having a few cocktails, and anything goes. I, you know, when I listen to a podcast and it's edited, that's the last time I listen to the fucking podcast. I want to hear everything. If the guy slept, if the guy slipped and said nigga or spick <laughs> or fucking lesbian or yeah. homophobic or something, so let it be. Maybe he was in the fucking moment. Did you ever think of that? <laughs> that people are in the moment and then when people are talking and they're talking about people and they get excited, they say things they normally wouldn't say, but it's not in a fucking abrasive way. Yeah, it's not I meant for hate. That's it's, what I want to yeah. hear. I want to hear that shit. I want to hear when Lee farts. I want to hear when Bert burps. This is what a podcast is. And unless you're doing that, it's not going to work. Not in my world. And there's people yeah. who disagree with me, and that's fine. There's people that wanted their podcast uh, groomed. Like, hey, we're no, back. This and I'm is like, why we got into that. this. That's not what I like. I want to listen to a podcast that any minute the, the cops could kick down the door. Listen, any minute, any day now, we're going to be doing a podcast and we're going to get swatted. Yeah. So can I, can I tell you? Can I tell you? That? Because it's true. It's can I tell me. you my favorite part of Rogan's podcast? Uh. This is old school Rogan. You'll remember this. Do you remember when that landline he had in his room would ring? And oh he yeah. Would and, and I used to love that because I go, oh yeah, the phone's ringing, and he'd go, fuck, like, I forgot to turn it off. He'd be like, ah, fuck. Those those things in podcasting That's, for me. I'm excited for like a, a podcast you, history class. Can you do me a favor? Because those are my favorites. I could teach it. Go, yeah, to, uh, absolutely. go to YouTube for a second. Okay. Or I want you to click in Lenny Bruce album. Let's I got to piss. I want to piss real quick. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Mighty finds this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go yeah, yeah. piss. Go, I'm going to piss. Go, I'm going to piss. Where's the, where's the bathroom? Right, right next door. To the left. Okay, come, I'm going to go piss. To the right. Piss if you don't make a move. Yeah, right, left, it don't matter. It kind of right. does. Ow. He's just clear. No, no, no. Pull it. Let me get some shout outs to my girl, Crystal Oaks, my main man in Jersey, looking out for me always. Mikey Klein with the One by One podcast. My main man, Paul Gaultieri, Randy Funderburk, Mike Dunn, Tenon Smith, Casey Seagrave, and my brother from a different mother, always Jeffrey Collins, who's a fucking soldier of debt. And I want to try and congratulate my main man, fucking talking Lair. He finally got a job. He's putting things together. Congrats, He's going to be coming to visit us in California soon. He's coming on a mission from debt. He doesn't even know it yet. I told him last week that he's on call. <laughs> he might have to fucking get in that fucking Hyundai <laughs> and put the Uber side on and bring a fucking victim with him. You know what I'm saying? And beside that, it's a beautiful night. We got fucking uh, my main man. Look for, what was I saying for you to look for? Oh, uh, old, you didn't tell me which one. Yeah, just Lenny Bruce out. Okay. Lenny Bruce out, okay? Let's just start with that. Let me see what you come up with. On YouTube? Yes, please. If you don't mind. What's that? You know, listen. When I got into comedy, I'm a lot older than you guys, or maybe a lot younger. There's a lot of people my age that listen to this stuff. When I got into comedy, I learned to listen to comedy from listening to albums. Okay. No, not stand-up, album. No, that was the first thing that popped up, so I didn't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I learned from listening to albums. Like, uh, right there. Right there, click the first one. Just click on to that. All right, uh, let's see. I wasn't even born yet. Never no. Seen this bit before. I want you to tell me. Stop me if you've seen it. I'm going to piss on you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we have so much acceptance. See that? I can't take the bit out. Every time I say, I just start as a gag once, you know, and they just say, hooray, hooray, hooray. Well, let me just do it through talk bits. But now I'll piss on this person, then you'll do the rest of the bits there. Do you now, hear the crackling in your earphones, guys? I tell yeah. you this because some of the ringside is... You think that's weird because you got a gay sparkler in your ear? Yeah. That's the album, guys. 
Listen to me. I want you to put on Richard Pryor's or something I like said. Right there, the fourth one off. down. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the world famous Latin Casino proudly presents the star of our show, Mr. Richard Pryor. Hit, 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 that pause, hit pause for one second. So, the thing I'm obsessed with right now, Joey. Is the first words that come out of a comic's mouth? Well, let's let's listen, let's listen right I'm, here. I'm obsessed with it. Well, let's listen. What the fuck are you gonna tell me? Let's hear it. Look at me. We are gathered here today <laughs> on this soft occasion. <laughs> To say goodbye to the dearly departed. He was dearly and he has departed. <laughs> Thus, that's why we call him the dearly departed. In other words, the nigga dead. <laughs> Dude, hit pause for one second. I'm sorry, Lee. But like that the thing I look about with specials now is I go. As you can see him laying. I go. What are the first words coming out of your mouth? Because I, you know, because I'm working on my special, I don't want to like build it up too much. But I go, you don't want too much of the like, uh, you know, what's up, Philadelphia? Is everyone good here? Is everyone having a good time? You want like, and I, I did that on my last special a lot. I was like, I, I, I riffed on. When you something. go to a restaurant. How do you like to get treated? Go to scroll that down till the end. I want to see if they got the wine on me. No, 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 on the video. Scroll it down because maybe that, like they said, number one eulogy. When you go to a restaurant, keep going. It'll just give the titles. When a woman leaves you, no. When you wait, go back. Go to the next one. Good night, kiss. Keep going. Beautiful women are beautiful. Our text for today. No. Click up there. Could be before Why that. Why no meets Dracula? Click up there. You know how you want to be treated, brother. Yeah. Just click up there. Why no meets Dracula, Richard Pryor. Erase the Lenny Bruce. There you go. You're fucking gonna. <laughs> How do you like to be treated when you go to a restaurant with your wife? I like to be served. No. Personally. Yeah. The first one. This is the Wino's first. Deal this is what got me into comedy. Right, right here, right here. Wino never get afraid of nothing but running out of wine. <laughs> That's the only thing that panic a Wino. Wino could deal with Dracula. <laughs> right, anyway. Hey, man! Say, nigga, you with the cake. <laughs> what you doing picking in that people's window? <laughs> What's your name, boy? Dracula? What kind of name is that for a nigga? <laughs> you know, this is 1970, guys. This is before rap. Where you from, fool? Oh, yeah. Transylvania? I know where it is, nigga. <laughs> you ain't the smartest motherfucker in the world, you know. <laughs> Even though you is the ugliest. Oh, yeah, you ugly motherfucker. Why don't you get your teeth fixed, nigga? That shit hanging all out your mouth. Why don't you go get you an offer, Donuts? Off a dollar. Dinners, you know, huh? huh? <laughs> this is 1975, boy. Get your shit together. <laughs> What's wrong with your natural? <laughs> <laughs> Got that dirt all on the back of your neck. You's a filthy little motherfucker, too. He was fucking killing, guys. Ugh. He's fucking killing it. You got to be home before the sun come up. You ain't lying, motherfucker. <laughs> See your ass in the day. You got to get arrested. <laughs> hey, click on to that one you up wanna there. You want to suck what? You want to suck what? Suck some black... Niggas, you... You some kind of freak, boy? An <laughs> uh, ugly freak? You ain't sucking nothing here, Junior. Junior? Suck your ass on away from here, what you better do. Holy shit. I love CDs. 
This is it. This is. I know you guys need to do specials now. I love this shit. But I love CDs. I love this shit. This I like sound. CDs too. I love this fucking sound, guys. <laughs> Click onto The Exorcist and see what that is. I All think right. you know. Did y'all see The Exorcist? Yeah. It's a story about the devil. Gets into this 12 year old girl. <laughs> Devil's a low motherfucker, Jack. <laughs> See, there wouldn't have been no movie, it'd have been niggas in it. <laughs> the movie would have been about seven minutes long. As soon as the devil spoke. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Hello. See, a nigga would have handled that movie different. The nigga would have walked in the house and went, What in the fuck is that funky smell? <laughs> And all that racket upstairs. Is the girl crazy? <laughs> Smell like shit in here. Some devilish shit at that. <laughs> you walk in the room. Bitch, what's wrong with you? Get up out of bed. Wash your ass, girl. You can tell Sitting it's going to be good because there's that one lady who laughed. Get the cross hear. out your pussy. Yeah. Get the cross out your pussy. This is like cutting edge back Get then. downstairs and help your mother straighten up the front room. We have them coming in. We didn't have black people talking like this yet. Oh my God. Like on media? See, I, I left, I left, let's see, turn it off. I left that fucking house that afternoon. I had to walk like a mile home. And I couldn't stop thinking about this. I didn't know I was going to be a stand-up comic. But this made me buy other albums and, you know, it opened up the fucking door. But this sound... This is why I started podcasting. I missed this. I missed that pure laughter. No HBO presents Showtime, but just a guy in a bar. That's why I love whenever I go somewhere and I see a Richard Pryor album, I buy it. Because it's as pure as when Lee and I did It's Either You or the Priest. It wasn't planned. Yeah. We didn't talk about it. We didn't have a cover taken. You told me you didn't know what you were going to say. Lee goes, let's go down to Bray. I got this thing. Let's try it out. It cost me $35 to rent. Remember the things that you guys all bought to do live podcasts? Yeah. That was it? Yeah, the Zoom we still use today. I we rented one for 50 Brea. bucks. I did a spot, and it became a number one CD on fucking iTunes. And Billboard. No, no stories, no drama, no God. big programming. It costs $40. If you listen to it today, you go, Joey, you know what, man? It sounded, I wanted it to sound like that. I want you to think. I want you to listen. This is why I fell in love with the concept of the podcast. Oh. Because I want, there's somebody hit me up on Twitter today. Oh, yesterday, did you not see that? I'm listening to the podcast right now where two ladies are knocking on your door. Saying that you're smoking mm, pot. No. That was one of the best podcasts in my life. With Felipe? If you listen to it, it's fucking god awful. Wait, what happened? Me and Felipe and and, and, and uh, the Christ Killer were at this other location we had on Burbank Boulevard. Uh, Dump. I remember that place, I think. No. No, no. It was, it, we no, uh, we, we had, barely we, had anybody there. We had three months there. The table was too big for the room. And it was a small table. Oh, oh it's, not the, it's not the place by uh, In-N-Out? No. No, this okay. was one that we had. That's a palace compared to this we place. We had this place for Had maybe, no AC. No AC. We were there for three months. It was an earthquake. There was a woman who was pretending to be a, a what is it called? When you stamp things? Uh, uh, notary? Notary next door. Yeah. She oh. kept complaining about the reef. Uh, they would bang on No, we weren't even smoking. And we weren't even smoking. It was a fucking nightmare. But one of the best things that was when she knocked on the door because it felt like I was on stage and the waitress's drink tray fell over and the glasses clanked. Oh, really? You're in the moment, guys. Oh, I love that. Yeah, you see? I love that. You understand what I'm trying to say to you? So this is why this is the style of this podcast we do. This is the only way I can do a podcast because I don't want to. I'm not a ESPN. Hey, how are you? I love that shirt. Yeah. Well, my opinion on it. And listen, fuck you and your fucking opinion. If I wanted your opinion, I'd turn on Channel 18 and be at home watching you, right? Yeah. You know, I just hate I hate all that shit. I always. So for me, this was perfect. This is what I like. I admire this. I want you to listen and think the cops are going to kick the doors in and arrest you. 
for listening to this. That's what a podcast means to me. Do you ever yeah. think about recording that the the Periscope part as part of the podcast? Because watching you get high and rant is one of my favorite things. Yeah, nah, listen. They're on every, YouTube. Everything. What's that? They're on YouTube. Everything is yeah. on uh we do everything sporadically, man. Who the fuck knows when you want a periscope? Yeah. I can't do it. I can't. You know, you 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 can't stay on social media all day and let them don't take you fucking seriously. It kills me. You got to give them a fucking breather. They're getting bombarded with so much shit. You can only give them so much shit, and then they go, hey, listen, we've taken enough shit with Uncle Joey. Yeah. You know, I try to get off two, three days, you know, something, a day here, a day there. You got to give people a fucking breather. It's amazing that what I use it for and what other people use it for. It really amazes it me. It amazes me, too. I, I I use it specifically to shoot those promo videos. That's all I do. I love the videos with the kids. and the, Yeah. It's fucking oh, phenomenal. Thanks. I'm in Cleveland. I love fucking get her involved. That shit's all fucking great. You know why? Why? Because it's better than a fat fuck coming on smoking pot that's 50 years old. Don't no. to go see him in Ontario, Canada. I don't know about that. At least it's great. You know what I'm saying? Like that That's the stuff that pisses me off. And now it makes everybody a director. That's Boy, what's happened to our right business. What happened to our business is it made everybody a director. You got that right. So they would do two little fucking films, show up to Paramount, and they'd get together and go, wait a second, this fucking humhead. I got to give him three quarters of a mil to shoot a movie. I got this fucking idiot from down the corner on Hollywood Boulevard. He got a degree from the Hollywood Film Institute or whatever the fuck. He's got a big YouTube channel. Yeah. Let's give him a... And this is what happens. And the, the, the last couple of lights, we've killed two hours in here high watching movie clips. And it was real weird that I showed Lee movie clips where you see what a director is. There's thought involved while you're watching the movie. There's yeah. tons of thought involved. Like I showed him a scene last night from a movie called Gotti with Armand Asante. It's like half the movie. And the greatest Mexican of all time. <laughs> uh, what's what's the Mexican's name again? Oh, uh, Benicio Del Toro? No. No. no He's the, Puerto Rican. The old school one. Old uh, school one. The guy that was across 110th Street. He's in the movie Revenge. Which is fucking phenomenal. But who's the good looking guy from the bodyguard? Oh, Kevin Costner? Anthony Quinn. <laughs> That's who I'm talking about. Fucking not. What are you giggling about, Bert Price? I'm I like that I picked the white guy. I'm dropping <laughs> knowledge on you and you fucking hit me with it. I got Kevin Costner and you go, Anthony Quinn. <laughs> is my name on that pillow? What pillow? No. It is. Why? That pillow's from Ikea. It says Bert. Oh. Do you see it? Listen, there's a frog oh, yeah. with that it fucking name. Bert, you got no it? right to fucking question a fucking pillow. There's Bert. a frog with your name. Did you know that? <laughs> no, there's not a frog with Bert, my name. Bert, isn't a frog the Bert? No, I think you're thinking of Bert and Ernie, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, he's not a frog. What is he? He's <laughs> a Muppet. But that doesn't make a difference. So you got a name that's shared with a Muppet, and you're worried about your name on a pillow. You got some pair of fucking balls, kid. You know that? <laughs> Hold on, I gotta go pee. I just saw, I just saw my name on the pillow. I've been looking at it, and I was like, I thought it was serendipity. I am getting yeah. fucked up. You brought your own. I was gonna, I was, I, I got some Tito's and. You did? Do you have any snacks? <laughs> no, there's no. We can't have snacks here. <laughs> we can't have snacks here. He's got a bag of pretzels. <laughs> no, we can't. But we can't eat stuff here. We'd go crazy. We'd be gamble. We'd go nuts. Oh, I, all I do is eat snacks right now. I'm thinking about eating a Death Star. I'm that hungry. Uh, when I got up to my highest, like I would go to the grocery store, my entire cart would just be diet soda and snacks. So are these Death Stars uh, yum, yummy? Yeah, if you eat one or two, they're pretty good. But when you start uh, eating five, you they start to build just, back it's up just, on it's you. It's just hard to eat five to ten gummies at once. Really? Yeah. You guys go do a bag a night? Probably for the bigger ones. We don't what was it like when you first started eating these? Uh, like, were you a big weed guy before you met Joey? No, not at all. Zero. So, so you, you I, how, like, how did you find Joey? Facebook. Well, I found him for through Rogan, but then I, I contacted him on Facebook. And then he was like, yeah, let's do something. Let's see if we connect. I uh, kind of. I, he asked me what, what my ideas were. And then uh, we just hung out at the haha for like a month at night. 
And that was crazy. I was like, someone, someone, someone asked me today on Twitter right before the podcast if I've ever been starstruck on the podcast. And I was thinking about it, and I was starstruck meeting Joey. Like, I was yeah. petrified. Really? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I've never, I've never been... I've always, I get starstruck by people who are on the news before I moved to L.A. And then, like, it was weird. And then... Since I've been with Joey, it's kind of there's nothing that can really phase you. But Wait, had you ever heard of me before you met me? Yeah, for real? Yeah, of course. You were on Rogan before you were on here, probably. Some Febreze, yeah. Please. You want some Febreze? Yeah, give me some Febreze. What happened in there? Yeah, we did go pretty hard in here. So yeah, so yeah, I met him then, and we then we uh, did Mad Flavors World. What's Mad Flavors World? We did. He did. He had a, a camera from Gabriel Iglesias, and he did little blogs and stuff, and he gave them to me once a week, and I did them together. Really? Yeah, we did, we did like fifteen of them, something like that. And then he called me one night at work, at like midnight, and said, "Would you like to shoot a documentary in New York?" Was that how you guys started with the is what the 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 doc was the one of the first thing? Yeah, yeah. and then the CD. Knew what we were doing there, dog. I thought he was like a film major. And that was I didn't know. I thought he was a know it all. Mm-hmm. He shows up. I never seen a movie before. I was gonna fucking stab him in the lung. <laughs> but we made it happen. I was an editing major. <laughs> And you kept calling me the director from Israel. I've never directed anything. <laughs> the director from Israel. That doesn't sound like Joey. <laughs> <laughs> he would tell me like that with the first thing, like when I was like brand new, he'd tell me to lie to people and like tell them you're from Israel. And I can't speak Hebrew. We're like, even pretend to speak Hebrew. But you never got a bar mitzvah? Yeah, well, yeah, but that's. Do that I mean, rant, that little baruch. You just out that. <laughs> If they're if they know how to speak Hebrew, they're gonna know you're just <laughs> doing the Torah. Doing the Torah, yeah. <laughs> I guess you could. You know, I shot how many fucking movies did I shoot? And I'd sit there and I'd watch these fucking morons make a big deal about shit. Yeah. And I would sit there and go, "This is how I would block this, right?" Like when yeah. I go on those things, I go, "All right, let me practice in my head how I would block this, how I would make this guy move across." And you know what? The last resort, I'd be like two steps off or something. Yeah. You know, it don't take a fucking genius. It don't take no fucking genius. I've been on fucking CBS shows that the director's a comedy legend. And you meet the guy and he's a fucking sleeping pill. And then you try to improvise and they fucking tell you you can't. Dude, uh, that's, you know. That, see, that's what we were talking about in the drive here. Yeah. About acting jobs and how... At one point, you get here, and that's what you strive for, is these little acting jobs. And you get on there, you do a couple of them, and then you're like, I ain't doing this no more, or if I do them, this is how I'm going to do them. Like, I would enjoy, like, I would enjoy acting, I think, more if I knew everything there was to know. Like, I want to know if I can take, like, other takes, and, uh... And, like, if I can improv, like, I remember Mike Epps was saying that he just would go in and do it the way he did it. Fuck him. And I was like, oh, I wish I had known that because I would try no. to do it the way they wanted no. me to do it. Here you go. You go to the audition or you don't go to the audition. They give you the fucking role. The first fucking day you're supposed to be there, your call's at 2 in the afternoon. Yeah. You look at the call sheet and see what time they're actually going to be there. And if it's at 7... They're paying you, number one. Number two, you're a professional. Yeah. You go down there three, four hours early, and while they're blocking, catch the director, and this is exactly what's going to happen. Hey, how you doing, Tony Burke Christ? Hey, I loved your audition tape. Obviously, I'm fucking here, dickhead. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, they hate yeah. that shit. And then they're like, <laughs> uh, yeah, is there anything special you want me to play in Do you this say program? that to him, or you keep that to yourself? <clears throat> whatever you make a fucking joke whatever you know they they, they loved how what you did okay let me ask you number, number two what do you want from me and they'll go well i want you to do the scene you did exactly the way like i was blown away sometimes how people would go like i got that scene right off the cuff and then they would go we'll work on this you know i would only ask them today what do you want from me fucking today 
what do you expect from the uh, from the fucking character? Yeah, you know, I tried to give him that that fucking lingo so that dick gets hard. Like I know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, if you yeah. tell them what you want from the character, they get the fucking apple and they eat it and they think like they know what the fuck they're doing. And then number four, I ask him. Number three, I ask him if he wants any special requests. Now you're in his world. And now you got to ask him. Can I ask you a question? And I'm not trying to be rude. I'm here for you. I didn't. I have no comedy scheduled. My wife's got the kids. How many takes do we do for each? And the guy really tell you. He goes, well, I just, you know, Adam Sandler. He does one from the script, one for him, and one for you. Clint Eastwood does two. Yeah. There's some fucking people who are just dickheads, bro. There's some guys you work with in that medium range level. It's their first big film with Fox or something. And they're just dickheads. I mean, there's nothing they could do. 22 scenes. You know, there was a couple of years ago I shot a commercial for a Big Daddy. I fucking snapped on that set. Go, Daddy. Go, Daddy. I fucking snapped on that fucking set. <laughs> the director was just a dick. Yeah. Just a dick. You got all the shots. You got all the <laughs> shots. How many fucking shots you want? Was that the one where you're getting, like, th- flour thrown in your face? Yeah. And they thought it was cute. And I know when somebody's trying to be cute. I ain't that much of a fucking moron. I know when some director's trying to be cute. The best was the fucking... Uh, what's the people that when you like? What's the fast food one? Uh, you like all of them. Yeah, Carl's Jr. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Carl's Jr. I did one of the director. That's like my least favorite. That director called well, me, don't have the director called me an idiot. Know. What? Because the fucking car had no brakes. When they connected the interior lights and cameras for the car, yeah. they disconnected the brakes. So the first really? time the car rolled, they said they fixed it. The second time the car rolled, and he said something else. I told him, fuck you, bitch. This, I went off. Really? And the other, it was two of us playing like Italian mob hits. The other guy is still my friend. Really? Till this day, because how I went off in that director. And at the end, the director had apologized to me. Like, fucking fire me. What do I give a fuck? Yeah. Who the fuck are you? What the fuck do you think you are? You know, you can't. But everybody was scared of him. He had an assistant that would come up to you and talk to you instead of him. I think there's it's less about talent and more about yeah. How, no, no, no. Knowing, knowing the right uniform to wear on yeah, set. Yeah, yeah. Oh no. Listen, if and there's some movies you go on the set, you know who the director is right away. Yeah. The the hat with the feather, uh, twenty two tattoos all the way to the fucking wrist. <laughs> the the mount the the wife beater t shirt. What's the pants they wear? Leather. Or the shorts, so they could show the tattoo on their calf. Little capri pants. Yeah, it's the same look you can see. Or if you have a woman director, you really have a problem. You have the dyed hair. You know, oh no, it's not with fun. all women directors. N- n- listen, we're talking I, about the cunty directors across the board. I'm no, 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 no. I worked with a woman on set of the Entertainers pilot. That was brilliant. She taught me a lot. Whew. I worked on. You know who was a good director, dog? Who? You know who directed me on the Soprano sketches for Mad TV? Who? The wife from Married with Children, not what's Peg Bundy? Man. No, the other one. Oh, the lesbian? Yes. Yeah. She directed me on Mad TV, Sweeter Than Pie. But there was something I did that I worked with a woman that I got there, and the <laughs> whole set was cliche. Oh. In fact, there was somebody who I was working with recently that contacted me. I went on their resume. I looked at their web page, and I go, oh, my God. I know who I'm dealing with. And I just knew it. Yeah. And she hit me with an offer, and I, and I knew. I knew the kind of offer she was going to go at me with. And then I told her, no, I couldn't do it. But you know the look. There's a look, a certain look that a woman gets when she wants you to know she's a director or a producer or... And it's so fucking cliche, guys. It sucks. I've worked with, like, women that are just natural, that are fucking tremendous. The ones that want to be artsy-fartsy. I worked with two gay directors one time that were fucking solid as fuck, too. We made a movie called The Mezzos. What was that about? The Mezzos. 
So let me tell you something about how, how weird the Hollywood works. First season of Sopranos, it's a fucking hit. Yeah. It's a fucking hit. Every network orders a mafia show, one way or the other. They're getting thousands of mob shows, thousands of mob-related shows. I know these two gay dudes in Hollywood, and they write a script about, you know that gay theater on Santa Monica Boulevard? Where they play gay porn sometimes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the head. Yeah. That's what? The, what are you guys talking about? That's the head. It's where. Uh, it's where. What's his name from? Uh, got busted. Uh, yeah, it's a. It's a super popular. Right there, yeah, super yeah, popular. Yeah, yeah. That's the the pink. Oh, that's something. The pink lace or something yeah. like that. Really that's the headquarters, and they did something else. Everything was very uh, gayish in a way. <laughs> And it, was these, way. and it was these two brothers who were gay, but they're gangsters. And nobody knows they're, they're gangsters. They're tremendous hit men. Yeah. So it's like pay only, no later type deal. So nobody knows these two guys are gay. They're not the flaming type gay guys. They're just the ones that, that are big. They go to clubs and intimidate <laughs> you and shit. Yeah. And uh, he wrote this up and took it to ABC. And ABC ordered the fucking script. Really? <laughs> Right? Okay. They they jack around a little bit, and he gets wind that the Sopranos were not happy with Big Pussy in real life. That They already knew that Big Pussy had asked for a bunch of money the second season. Really? And that he was getting killed off. Like, once he's, you know, the rumor is on Sons of Anarchy when That's, he asked yeah. for money... You get killed off on some of those shows. Oh, well, the quicker you ask for that raise, is the quicker they kill you off. So these two gay guys who are sweethearts, I still talk to the one guy Joe. Contact went to New York and met with Vincent Pastor, and they got Vincent Pastor money to shoot a pilot about two gay guys that are getting in the mafia in L.A. and they own a theater. Yeah. And that's their headquarters, and they loan out money. They did something else that was pretty funny. The guy did do a good job yeah. without just being like, we weren't flaming fat, you know, yeah. nothing like that. He did something, I can't remember what the fuck it was. And I had to go to Fox and audition. And No. You ready for this one? Yeah. They shoot a pilot. ABC says, kaboosh. We don't want the thing. Or they didn't shoot the pilot. So everybody was standing there with the dick in their hand. They took it to everybody else. Everybody else passed on it. These two guys didn't want to fucking just lose the project. So they sold it to Fox Searchlight, whatever the fuck that is. And Big Pussy didn't want to do it for that price. Really? So we all auditioned from scratch. Every From Frank Stallone to Nick Turturro. Really? To any guy you saw in Goodfellas, Johnny Roast Beef. Wow. And I got it. Like, the two guys who got like, if you would have told me that me and this other guy were going to get it, I went all against it. Me and, I mean, there were stars in that room. Yeah. The guy that got shot in the eyeball from The Godfather was in that room. I mean, Oh, was, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. There was a thousand Italian stars in that room. When I got the call back, I was in fucking shock. Yeah. And this is the funny. See, you don't know what, see, people have no idea what the route is here. I had, at that time, one of the smartest guys I ever had working with in the entertainment business at that time. He was a genius. In fact, he just texted me about a week ago, and he said that he listened to a podcast where myself and Jimmy Schubert were on yeah. discussing him, and he was... He goes, it brought tears to his eyes, how proud he was of us. He was mine, Jimmy Schubert's manager. He had six killers that nobody knew about. And he would live and die for you. Like if I, I bumped into Billy Gardell at Arts maybe three months ago. Really? And Billy asked me, he goes, you ever talk to Jeff again? Jeff was the one that got Billy going. So wait, how did, you know, how did you know, how did you meet, how did you meet Billy? Oh, I've known Billy since 1998. For real? Yeah. We used to go to 
I still remember when Billy Gardell and Billy Gardell, for those of you who don't know, is a kid from Mike, Mike and Molly. Mike from Mike and Molly. I know Billy from, I still remember in 98 being at Coaching Horses with him at 4 in the afternoon. Him and a girl, that's a comedian girl that's still in town, broke up. And uh, we were in there, me, him, and Stan, or maybe a few other people. Really? Yeah. I so wait, so wait, so wait, uh, t- take me back to them. Like, what was it like back then? Like, you hold really on, let me just tell you the story. About oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm guy. sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I really give props to this guy. The problem with this guy was that I wasn't strong enough for him. He was getting me into fucking rooms <sighs> that my knees would crickle. Yeah. Like, into auditions, like, you're going down there and you're reading with Travolta today. Like, that type of shit. 1998. I just got here. I'm a criminal. I'm shit. doing blow six nights a week. <laughs> And I'm going to these auditions that I could not handle. But, bro, this guy always had a plan. Yeah. He's like, this is what's going on. So I go, should I do this project? It was like 250 a day. Flat. It was 500 for the weekend. If they went over a certain amount of hours, they would give me an extra 100 bucks. But the dude said they would take care of me. I asked him. I go, bro, should I do this? He goes, Joey. The Sopranos is the hottest show on TV right now, and they're working on a thousand projects. You need this tape. He goes, I know these guys. They're shooting on something. Yeah. Shoot it. I shot it. Came out great. Got into a bunch of all uh, fa- gay film festivals. I got a couple meetings from it, but he gave me a call and then he goes, "You're going to go eat read for that movie about Chuck Barris. Remember that movie they made yeah, about yeah, the yeah, host yeah, of the yeah, yeah. Dong Show?" Yeah. He was in the CIA and yeah. shit like that. She made me go. He made me go in for this role that I didn't want to fucking read for. I go, I'm not going in there for this. They're looking for two Mexicans. He goes, listen, you're going to take this role. He goes, you're not going to get this. He goes, I think they already have an offer I don't want. But he goes, that doesn't matter. I want you to go in there and rock her world. Wow. Don't give her an accent. Rock her world. Listen to me, bro. I went in there and rocked her world. She called me back. I went to producers. I didn't get the role. But on the way out, the second time I went to she made me go to producers once, then twice, which meant she liked me. On the way out, she goes, it was great to see you. Thank you to come. She goes, regardless of what happens here today, she goes, I want you to keep in touch with me. She goes, anytime you do a new project, I want you to hit me up. This lady was like fucking huge. Yeah. This lady, but she wasn't here. She wasn't even based out of L.A. I forget what her name is. She was based out of New York. If you go to my IMDb, you'll see what her name was. Within four weeks, I get the tape from the Mezzos. Jeff Gatlin was the manager. He called me. He goes, where's that Mezzos tape? I go, well, they said they won't give it to me. He goes, let me call you back. Next thing he goes, he called me. He goes, listen, they want you to go by the house and pick up two scenes. I went by the house. I picked up two scenes. I sent a game to Jeff. Jeff sent them to some guy. Some guy fucking pop, 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 pop. This is 2003. Jeff sends me this and he goes, Joey, I'm sending this to the lady you read for. Yeah. Well, what did she do? What did analyze you? that. What did she, who put me in that? Who was the casting director in that? Click on to analyze that and I'll tell you. Okay, give me one second. And in fact, her assistant is now a big casting director here. Really? She put me in something about two years ago, and she was casting Whitney. Oh, really? Yeah. No, no, no. That being how life that works. That's crazy. I never thought that you'd read for something and you wouldn't be right for it, and they go, he's not right for this, but he's right for other things. Well, I always it, thought, I was like... It's a bullshit cover-up story. Yeah. But you know when somebody is telling you the truth, you'll get the handle for it. Not your agent, you. Yeah. When you're walking out of the room, there's times that the producers already have somebody. Yeah. But she's trying to save them two hundred thousand dollars. Do you understand me? You go in there and do a good job, but it ain't enough to save them two hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Ellen Chenoweth. Ellen Chenoweth. Oh, Click uh, on to Ellen Chenoweth. You know who that, you know that is. You see who Ellen Chenoweth casted. Ellen Chenoweth's life. daughter is uh, the girl that was in Wicked. Look at Ellen Channel with what she's casted. Read them out loudly. Okay, do you want to start from the top or the bottom? Like, Whatever you want. Just read ton of them. All right. She's a savage, Ellen Channel with. And mostly De Niro movies. 
Oh yeah, a lot of oh brother, where art thou? Analyze that. Uh, Mona Lisa smile. Uh, analyze this. The horse whisperer. Wag the dog. Lolita affliction. <coughs> no, no, no. She's heavy duty, bro. Yeah, I kept in touch. Who's her daughter? Who's a her daughter? A Bronx tale. Who's her daughter? A Bronx tale is great. Who's her daughter? Um, I'm still going down. Terms of endearment. Come on, terms now. of endearment. The no, natural. I can't be with her, her daughter. Yeah, no, no Brittany Chenoweth. No, no, no. No, I don't, I don't, know you're don't worry about who the fucking mother. No, 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 no. This is uh, go to. Is it got no? She has eighty four credits. That's up. crazy. Keep going up. Keep going up. And then Kristen Fulbile. Kristen Chenoweth. Find out. Click Kristen Chenoweth. She was the one that started uh, Wicked. I think Wicked was a big biggest play on Broadway. Kristen Chenoweth is in Wicked. Am I right? I don't know. Click it. I I didn't click it. I just knew it. Click it. There's nowhere to click. Oh. Then maybe I'm wrong. Let me see. But that those mezzo stupid tapes that I did for five hundred dollars, yeah. he sent them to Ellen Channel with. I can't analyze that. Really? That's how he knew, always knew what was and I would bang it out with listen, man, I remember being in fucking New York doing stands doing comedy of fucking rascals and him calling me going, You have any tapes here? And I'm like, Yeah, he goes, Bring a tape over to What's his name? They're casting a show called The Sopranos. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? I don't know how to sing. <laughs> Instead of dropping the tape off The Sopranos, the Sopranos, I dropped the tape off at like Roger Paul and two other bummy fucking comedy agents. <laughs> I can't sing. The Can tenors. you believe that? That's yeah. how strong Jeff Gatlin was, bro. Yeah. Jeff Gatlin got me out for, oh my God. Oh, my God. I remember one time Jeff Gatlin had these guys put together a game show around me where I was the host, and you had to burglarize somebody's house, and fucking, it was just crazy. And they got sold to NBC because they were getting ready for the strike. This was crazy. And Joe came with me. This is 97, 98, right. 2000, 2001. We were doing something one night, and I go, Joe, I got a fucking call back. You got to drive me. And he was pissed. We went. He walked in there with me. He showed me how to do it. That's how cool that motherfucker is. Yeah. He was already hosting Fear Factor. And he's like, let me show you how to do this. And I did it. And then they went with a fucking black dude. And then they shot the pilot. And no, nothing happened. <laughs> Ever called him racist? Had a black guy breaking into houses? Something. A black dude. A fucking mixed dude. Yeah. Some shit like this. So what else has been going on in your life? Nothing, man. Just the road. I, I, I think I work too much. But my pod, my podcast has been doing really well. That's you release your podcast how many times a week? Once a week. That's on it. Wednesdays. Just one one podcast a week. I did it. I did. There was a period where I was doing two a week, and I just noticed that my, I was losing. My ratings were cutting in half. Like it wasn't. Like if I had released it on Wednesday. I release it every night at Tuesday at like 6 p.m. So that it's out there Wednesday morning for everybody, because that's where Libsyn kind of like cuts does a cut off. But uh, and I also kind of fine tuned it. You know, it's so funny. My biggest podcasters were always when we you'd come over and we party. Me, you, Ralphie, me, you, Tommy, me, you, Tommy, and my dad, me and Tommy and Burr, me and Ari and and Renazizi. Like those are my biggest podcasts. So I kind of just looked at the numbers and I was like, well, shit. If those are the biggest ones, I'll just keep doing that. So I I was like, all right. So now, if I do my podcast, I do it Monday nights at eight thirty, is when I, I I I tape it, and we just and we just have a few cocktails. <laughs> One of my fa- finest moments in podcasting, believe it or not, had nothing to do with me. I get a call one night that we're gonna go over to uh, to Bert Kreis's house. Bert calls me to his house. He invites me over. He's very gracious, and he goes, "Come over at a certain time." I'd like for you to do a podcast. At the time, I thought Bert was Johnny Professional. I get over there 20 minutes too early. He invites me into his man cave. He offers me something. We sit there. He gave me that weed from that you like, the sativa from uh, Betsy Crocker, whatever the fuck uh, name is. Phil Stiller? <coughs> you even bought a joint. You were very yeah, yeah, curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we sat there and waited for Ralphie May. We got a call about 8.15 saying that Ralphie was coming up over the hill. 
I remember you going, Burke Reicher. He's not coming over there. Anyway, <laughs> listen to me. It's 9 o'clock, and I go, listen, call him again and ask him where he is. So now he calls again. You call him. You call him. You call him. I go, Bert, I think that's a reality that we might as well stop this. And also the phone rings, and Ralphie May is like, I'm stuck on Laurel Canyon. I'm just pulling up. I'm by a gas station. There's a... A Don't pie, give the whole address. A pie place across the street. No, I'm talking about Laurel Canyon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what he's close to. And uh, Bert directs him to where he goes. But anyway, I got there to call at 8. The podcast was supposed to start at 8. It's 10 to fucking 10. So Ralphie comes in smoking a vapor pen. I'm sitting there with Bert. We're having a blast. It's a great podcast. We go back and forth. Finally, it's, mid, it's 1230 at night. The girls are sleeping. Uh, it's time to go. We hug. We, we walk out. I walk. I follow Bert out. Right? I follow Bert out. I don't know nothing. I can't see at night, so I'm going to follow the fucking leader. It's his house. But all of a sudden, I assume Ralphie's behind me, and I just hear, pa ba 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 and we both turn around in shock, and there's Ralph, you laying in your daughter's dollhouse. It was, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was. <laughs> it was. <laughs> How's the dollhouse? Oh, uh, it, it was, it was, uh, it was, <laughs> it was destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> Dog, it was like a meteor hitting one of those Chinese villages. It was, and I remember me and Bert looked at each other and we could not laugh. Listen, you could uh, not laugh at your friend, okay? What are you talking about? No, no, no. There's listen. There's certain situations when you laugh at your friend. You did something yeah. stupid. They gave you a Chinese instead of Italian, you know. But there's just certain times where. Oh, something happens to a friend of yours and you cannot fucking <laughs> But that time uh, that time period has passed, listen, I guess. No, listen to me. He falls. What was it? Please burn. It was uh it was um it was uh beach chairs. <laughs> it was beach chairs. <laughs> it's like the kind that you can fold up and put into a sleeve and then open up and then turn into a chair. And he fell on top of them. And literally, like he didn't, he, ah! he, wasn't, hurt. <laughs> he wasn't hurt at all. <sighs> he fucked them up. All you heard was like, you thought there was 40 kung fu masters in the room, karate chopping wood. You heard each karate chop, each piece of wood go down. Uh, it looked like someone just destroyed a tent. Oh they, my just, God. they were all flat. Oh my God. And he's like, oh, player. What was that? <laughs> I was like, and, but, and by the way, they were cheap as shit. They weren't like a super expensive. <laughs> That's why he went right through them. Yeah, he went right through them. They were the fucking cheapest ones you could get. Uh, and he was like, play, let me give you a hundred bucks for them. I was like, Ralphie, they cost five bucks. Uh, but he was, uh, yeah, he was fucking high as shit walking out uh, of that house. We had to pick him up. Yeah. That's no picnic. <laughs> he was like, ah, oh, play, I'm going to get in the car and drive home. We're like, ah, oh, you sure? So the whole time, I'm walking out with him, and I got that ball of laughter stuck. <laughs> like, if it's right behind my heart. That 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 oh. yell I was supposed to let out, <laughs> like, there was a yell when that happened at that point that I was supposed to let out that I did not let out, and I just wanted to go in my car. Oh. I just wanted to get to my car. And he kept asking, well, what are you doing tomorrow? Meet me at the country club. <laughs> we'll get the kids swimming and all this shit. I'm like, Ralphie, I got to go. <laughs> I got to go to the bathroom really bad. Listen, guys, I got in the car. That door wasn't shut four minutes. And I just let out laughter. It was just incomprehensible. I'm starting the car sideways. Like, I was like, ah. As I got around the corner, I called Bert. He wouldn't answer the toe. Ask Bert. Was that the funniest fucking thing? It was. You had ever seen in your life. I'm still laughing from, because Bert and I and him were walking out very like, uh, je ne sais quoi. Like it was, no, <laughs> it was no big deal. We're just walking out of here like we, we walked out of here a thousand times. And all of a sudden you hear, blah, 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 blah. Oh, 
Oh, we were on the like, it, like I remember, I remember getting done that and sitting in the man cave and just and looking at that chair, just going, "How do I explain that to the girls?" <laughs> <laughs> I've had so many, ex- I, I've had so many run-ins with Ralphie that I that are make me laugh so hard. I mean, my favorite one is we went. Uh, he's gonna hate that I'm saying this. We went to. Uh, I bet he loved the first story. Oh my god. He, I know what Ralphie's saying in his head right now in this story. We go to uh, we do uh, Atlantis with Paul and Young Ron, and Ralphie and I are, are the comedians. Ralphie's headline, and I'm kind of open. I'm not kind of open. I'm definitely opening for him. <laughs> I'm doing 20 minutes. Ralphie's doing an hour. So every fucking night we go out to dinner. Every night we go out to dinner. R- Ralphie orders a fucking grab bag of beautiful stuff to eat, and he pays for it every fucking night. So, the last night, Leanne's like, hey, we got to put our credit card down. We can't let Ralphie pay. He's paid for, like, fucking five meals. So, like, lunches, too, you know? So, uh, so we go to NoHo. We go to NoHo. I think some, whatever the, not NoHo. Sobu, Subu, Sobu, whatever the sushi restaurant in that place is, we go there, and I, I stop the lady before we even get the meal. I go, hey, give her my credit card. I go, the big guy doesn't pay. She's like, okay. So she comes up with a bill at the end of the night, and she hands it directly to me, and Rafi goes, play, I got that. And I was like, no, Rafi, I already paid. And he starts giggling, hardy shit, and he goes, oh, you don't want that, player. You don't want that. <laughs> I was like, Rafi, no, I got it. I got it. I open it. And I see the bill, and it's twelve hundred dollars. And I go, and and he sees my eyes, realize I can't afford it. Like he's like I can't afford it. I can't afford. It. I'm featuring. I can't afford it. No one can afford he, it. He sees my eyes, and he starts laughing. This Ralphie laugh. And then Leanne says, "How much is it?" And I go, "Shut the fuck up. That's how much it is." And <laughs> Ralphie goes, "Oh, play. You just done fucked up. You should have just let me pay for it." <laughs> I was I wasn't willing to spend what we paid for in a tip. Like the tip was fucking uh, two hundred and forty bucks. I wasn't willing to spend that. It and then I went and the first thing I did I went out right up to the bank machine and I pulled out a thousand dollars and put it on black and lost. What? I fucking went down like four thousand dollars that night and then I got into a huge fucking fight. Oh, and then Ralphie's I, I said it on radio one time. Ralphie's like. Player, we didn't eat 1,200 pounds of sushi, 1,200 pounds of sushi. You drank $1,000 worth of booze, and we had $200 worth of sushi. I was like, I don't know, Ralphie. It's probably somewhere like four and eight. They were bringing out dolphins. Like, this is all we got left. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I told Lee the other night when Ralphie first hit, it was very fun to see. He's the sweetest guy in the he, world, man. Listen, when he was broke... He was doing some amazing things. I've always loved that kid. Yeah. We were talking last night, you know, uh, about Houston food. And I said, listen, you guys, they were talking about queso. And I'm like, I'll tell you what, don't even bother. And they go, why not? You're being negative. I go, you know what? Because I hung out with Ralph when he first moved here. And there was 10 of them from Houston. And they would get together every night. This was when Doug gave Ralphie the apartment on Gardner. Doug Stanhope had an apartment on Cumston, on... Gardner? No, on the apartment on the street where uh, 7-Eleven is in, on Sunset Boulevard. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. The 7-Eleven. So yep. the block after that was Nick DiPaolo, and Mitch Hedberg lived on that block. The block after that was Ralphie, and the block after that was Josh Wolf. In 1998, that's wow. how it was. All right, that's how it was. He was on Kirsten or something like that. Then there's Del whatever, and then there's Gardner. That's yeah. where Ralphie lived, and Vista is where Josh Wolf lived. This was a great comedy neighborhood. And let me tell you something. As broke as he was, Ralphie, he would leave the comedy store and invite you to his house, and he would deep fry a turkey in the backyard. You'd be eating deep fried turkey at 5.30 in the morning with mashed potatoes and stuff and playa. Yeah. He would go back to his house and cook for us. They, I was telling Lee, they used to drive to Houston 24 hours straight. 
to bring back Bloody Mary mix and what's the beer they drink? Shinerbach. Shinerbach, yeah. That's how crazy they were. Because Jody, Celine, rest her soul. Stacy, she died recently, about six months ago, rest her soul. They were all friends of Ralphie. Yeah. Ralphie knew Stacy from the comedy club. <clears throat> Celine let Ralphie stay with her while they were getting ready to move to L.A. And Jody's a comic from Houston, you know, and they all drove up. Really? After that, John Wesling came up with them. After John Wesling? After that, fucking a bunch of other Houston comics came up. And they had their own little community. Really? And they would get together, and it was always the same argument. Oh, I went to this fucking place. It says Texas barbecue. The place sucks. I said, give it up. When you go to Texas, that's when you eat barbecue. When you're yeah. here, you're just going to get ripped the fuck off. Or you're not gonna... My wife, she's from the South like your wife. Nobody complains more than them about... So when oh. she tries to hit me with something, I go, whoa, 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 You're from the South, correct? Yeah. Do we go to that barbecue place? No, because it's terrible. The same fucking difference. Yeah. That's why I don't want you cooking Cuban food. We had the. We were in Tampa Airport. We went to La, La Columbia in Tampa Airport. And I said to Leanne, I said, you know, uh, I know it's an airport, but this is legit Cuban food. Like, we're in Tampa. They're not having... Like, this is Cuban people making this food. And we had Cuban food. She had picadillo, arroz con pollo, and, uh, na, not paella, um, ropa vieja. And then we had, uh, croquetas and, uh, and, uh, Cuban sandwiches. I bought it, I just bought it all. But Spanish rice and white rice and black beans. And Leanne got so fucking into it for her birthday the other day. She was like, I want Cuban food. So we went to La Taberna Cubana. Have you been there? No, where is it? It's oh, up on L- Laurel Canyon. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's not the best. Oh. It's not the best. You got to call next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as you walk in there, you smell the food, how bad it is. I took Lee in there one time. We walked out. Wasn't it you and I? I don't think that was me. Me and, you, me and Jerry Rocha walked in there. Yeah. They took a little too long to get to the table. And before they got to the table, I go... I think we should get out of there. So yeah. one day I had a Uber, like a regular driver. He picked me and Lee up for uh, getting high with Doug. And he gave me his number, and I called him for an airport run one day. I left my phone in his car, and I called him. He goes, I'm right around the corner. He was. He said he was a Cuban dude. Well, now a lady comes back with my phone, but he also brought me a Cuban sandwich from that place. It they use was... Uh, God awful. It was yeah. It's not Cuban bread. The only the only thing I've ever gotten there was uh, chicken and rice, right? A roast con pollo. It was. It's it's not bad to me. I, it tasted okay because it's only chicken and rice. But to, I, they probably didn't do it right. No, well, no, they didn't. No, no because no, a roast con pollo isn't the way that it's a, that the way they do it is a little different than when the way I had it in Tampa growing up. In Tampa growing up, there was a presentation to it. You know. Um the red peppers on the sides, oh. over the sides, and they really want to dope it up. Some plantains around the side, the the, the gooey ones, not the hard ones. Yeah, the gooey ones. That's are the what best. it usually calls for. You know, if you're gonna go to eat Cuban food in this area, I'll tell you what to where to go and what to get. Where where do we go around here? You go over the hill to Silver Lake to a place called El Cochinito. El Cochinito. Go to the menu, Lee. El Cochinito, and you get yourself. <laughs> Dude, Picadillo is my favorite. Ropa Vieja is good there. Picadillo is good there. But my favorite, this is the place I used to cater my wedding. Really? Do you understand me? What's the name of this place again? El Cochinito. But what I did was, I only got the pork chunks with the white rice and the black beans. Smoking. Smoking. Really? But I took my wife this last time on date night. And we ordered the Cuban fried rice. Listen, if you like East Coast fried rice, get the fried rice in this place. Really? Jesus Christ. 500 views, four stars. I'm in. I'm going there tomorrow. Well, you're yelping too. You're worse than my little fucking Christ killer over here. He goes on Yelp. He can't even go to the bathroom without yelping. They have some bathrooms on Yelp. Look at it. Check it out. What's the one special tomorrow, Lee? Arroz con pollo, picadillo, ground beef with potatoes and olives, and frijoles colorado, 
red beans. Oh shit. We we might be doing road trip. I kinda wanna go with you guys. At, you got a late you got a late late night flight. Oh yeah. I can't right. go in the morning. That's the best time to go, but at one thirty it'd be we could leave here at one thirty, be down there. I'm supposed to be in Anaheim tomorrow. For what? That that's not happening. We're going to get Cuban food. <laughs> Call Anaheim, tell them the conference has been cancelled. If they want a conference, they gotta pay you. They gotta come over here to see you. Yes. In fact, as a matter of fact, you're selling conferences as we speak right now. The next one is uh, September 8th over here at the Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> You'll be doing your own conference on podcasting. What's that? Charging is that- five hundred dollars for these fucking jerk calls to come and learn nothing from people who haven't done decades. Are you doing a podcasting event? No, I'm on, I'm on, I'm, I'm just going to... Oh, one. shit. Thursday's Conde con Papa. It's a very nice With man. With a boy on Friday. Invited me. It's Paella Valencia. Paella is a fucking amazing. And Chuletas, pork chops. Are every every day... fucking kidding me? Every day at our high school, we? we had uh, uh, the Palomilla. Tremendous. The every black. day, every day How we have Palomilla. How you have that in fucking high school? Every because we have Cuban uh, that is cooks, crazy. all Cuban women. I man, I'm I must have eaten that. I must have had because you could get you could get uh every day you could get black beans and rice. No matter what was they were serving, they always made black beans and rice, and they always made uh like once a week there was every meal we had was Cuban food for all because it was all Cuban uh, women cooking in our kitchen. So every day you could get black beans and rice, no matter what it was, spaghetti. You still could get black beans and rice. And the palomilla, you could always get that. Man, I must have had that every... And then you had uh, Krispy Kreme donuts in the morning. Just cri- and brand new Krispy Kreme donuts. Were just they warm? Fresh. No, not warm, but they were fresh. Like, they, were st- they weren't stale yet. Dude, I used to light those motherfuckers up. And number two, not to change this concept of the pot of what we're talking about, food or whatever. Yeah. Just to get this wrapped up. You also have... Listen... I did the Rogan podcast, man. Between you and I, as friends, and yeah. Lee and the church people who listened to it, whatever, you liked it. I was kind of ashamed by it. I was kind of ashamed that Rogan let it go. But hold on. Oh. That Rogan let it go there. But uh, I could have done that, I so done that on Tom hard. Segura's podcast. I laughed. I was on the tra- was hold on. I'm going to stop you. I was on the treadmill. So I said, when the Rogan's podcast started, I said, there's going to be three plus hours of, of something I want to see. My, three of my favorite human beings just bullshitting, getting high, and drinking. And I was like, I'm in. So I said, I got on the treadmill, and I'm going to start watching. And it, 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 there was a slow build. The first hour was like a slow build. No, not even an hour, 30 minutes. It was like, a, you know, getting warm. Everyone's getting a little bit of a buzz. Man, there was a part where I'm holding on to the sides of my treadmill, doubled over laughing, and I start tweeting, Joey Diaz is killing me right now killing me i i was on the treadmill for the entire fucking podcast walking and running not running the whole time but walking and running so i'm listening it was one of my favorite it was one of my favorite podcasts i've ever listened to it's you just, were so funny that i called tom right so with the conversation we were having about later i called tom immediately when i was at, after and i was like that i was like what t- tell me about it like just tell me about it he was like joey's the fucking next level, man. He's the funniest guy that well, we know. We are. We've been doing this for six years now. Yeah. You know, this is this is what I do two nights a fucking week. And I'm trying to write a book so those, these memories are fresh in my mind. Oh. These crazy fucking things I bring up from the dead and I go, oh my God. You know, I, I was telling me, I was telling my wife today that at my mom's funeral, at the wake, her best friend, with white powder in her nose. There's 200 people in the thing, it's the second night, and she goes, I gotta tell you something, I don't like half the people in this fucking room. (laughs) And I go, sorry, and she goes, I'm telling you, and your mother didn't like them either. She went up by the casket, and in broken English, she's like, can I have your attention, please? And she goes, listen, not for nothing. I see a lot of you people having a good time drinking. There's a lot of people in this room that you didn't like Denora and Denora didn't like you. Do me a favor, finish your drink, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> like, I got shit for days that I sit here and go, what the fuck just happened? 
that's the thing about you that makes you different than that I think but then again you met with what's his name you're the fucking whatever for a thesis for a book you were the number one party kid in fucking Tampa, Florida and shit. People were driving up eight hours just to have a drink with you or some shit. Yeah, but I'm not I'm but yeah, the but the thickness of your life matters. You know, on stage I talk about how I had a childhood. I even though my mom died and stuff, I still remember going to Dunkin' Donuts by White Castle and putting my dick on the glass. Going to the child going to the counter putting my dick on the glass and ordering donuts and then ordering a donut from underneath and the lady would see your dick. That's childhood. No matter what was going on in my fucking life, you know? I'm glad I'm glad I wasn't one of those kids that came out to LA and at twenty seven had a lot of heat and everyone was like I mean I did I did have a lot of heat at twenty seven. But I'm glad I wasn't the guy that like I can I like not to but like I'm glad that I had to struggle. And then I got had to that I didn't that I'm glad about that that when we all got into podcasting, we were all looking for something and we were hungry for something and we all did something at the at the right time for us. And if look, if this podcasting goes away tomorrow, I'm cool with that. I'm cool with this. Yeah. I'm cool with I'm this. Cool with I learned that. a big lesson. I learned a very big lesson and I had assumptions and this is something that you cannot doubt me on because I have my friend over there that'll tell you every assumption I had. At least I had. What are you looking at this cup for? Like you're a guy in the desert you've never seen water for. Every assumption I've had with you has come true, especially when it's come to podcasting. I saw the growth. I was on the road. You're on the road. You see the interest. Yeah. yeah. You see the interest. The number one thing people say to me is, hey, thank you for the free content. Okay. All I, the time. I, I, had, and I, it, I was and driving it, a forklift, and I listened to you and Joey Diaz for three hours, and you guys got me to lunch. And you're like, dude, fuck, dude. I, you know, Tremendous. Yeah. Tremendous. That's the best compliment I can get. I've been in New York City about to take the ferry. This is great. I went and did an Opie and whoever, Sam, <laughs> and I fucking take a cab to whatever. And I'm staying in Weehawken, so I take the ferry over. When I'm out there, it's freezing, and some guy goes, Hey, I'm listening to you right now. We start oh, talking. It's the greatest feeling Listen in the world. To me. We start talking. <clears throat> and he goes, You wouldn't happen to have one of those stars of death on you, would you? And I go, You know what? It's your lucky day, motherfucker. Listen, just kill it up. I still had it. I just found this card about three months ago in my drawer. I have a card clip. Yeah. He's like, listen, you and Joe Rogan ever want to fucking box at a Jet game? And he gave me his card, and it was like, New York Jets. Da, 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 da. And I was like, wow, I showed Rogan. Yeah. I go, Rogan, if we ever, you know, Rogan don't want to go to a yeah, fucking yeah. Jet game. So it was just crazy that this guy went to the fucking Jets. He was about to go to work. He had two cell phones in his fucking head. I mean, you could tell the dude was somebody, nice suit. And he stopped what he was doing, and he was like, hey, what about this one that I told Rogan the other day? I've done some crazy... Listen, some weird shit has happened Yeah. in the last five years that even I have been blown away. The family who came up to me in front of Tom Segura in Portland, a family, a mom with her three daughters going, we listen to your podcast, and the little girl's like, yeah, cocksucker, and I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> was three weeks ago when I went to get this haircut. I went to jiu-jitsu, I took like a Puerto Rican shower, I wiped down with that thing. I went to the clean jiu-jitsu, where it's always really clean. I go to two different places some weeks. Yeah. And uh, I went over there to get a haircut, but it was 245. 245. I'm fucking, you know, my haircut's at three. Yeah. I can't come all the way home. It's right by Porto's. I'm right by Porto's. Okay, yeah. The line's too long. I don't even have time to wait for a fucking sandwich and get to the barber. I'm watching, and there's fucking hundreds of people walking in Magnolia. Between Magnolia is dead all the way up to Porto's. And then from Porto's for about a half a mile, it's rocking. Yeah. In the daytime, they got a Cuban coffee shop at Cotarito. They got a the pie place. They got a there's uh, a Red Wing shoe place. Yes, <laughs> a, there's a 
uh, what's that? Uh, you seen the makeup store that they have do- that they have donut, lines outside? Don't they have like a, a famous do- donut place or something? Isla gets her hair cut around there. Something. I get, yeah. So I went over there and I parked right on Magnolia and you know I'm a fucking savage. <laughs> you know I'm a savage. What do you think I do? I got 15 minutes to kill. I gotta get a haircut. This is the first time in there. I'm a little nervous. Light a I know the trick. Let a number. You know I did. I put the air on and I opened up the windows. Uh. And I'm watching these white people in Burbank looking around for who's smoking and I'm blowing clouds out of the sunroof yeah. with the fucking air blast. And you understand? With the music on, like nobody's even in the car. And I'm sitting there like an undercover cop. <laughs> You know me, I got tactics. I'm an ex burglar. There's just smoke coming out of it, but there's no one in it. No, no, no. When I got the air on, and then from time to time, I opened up the back window, and it was right on the corner. It was right on the corner, so people who were crossing the street could smell it. I'm opening up the windows, blah, blah, blah. So now I leave the windows down. After the joint was done, I put it back in the tube. The perennial gives you a tube. I put it back in the tube. And I put it in the door handle, so when I walk out, I take it with me and dump it on the fucking the garbage. So I sit in the car, and 10 minutes, boom, it's 3 o'clock. I pull up the windows, the car's all aired out, I spray for breeze, and I walk across the street. I walk to the corner. I don't even walk out of my car and jaywalk, because Burbank, they're kind of weird. Yeah, yeah. Burbank, they see you, you're looking at your phone, you're getting two tickets. Don't fuck around in Magnolia, Jack. Oh, yeah. By the 7-Eleven, though, that's where they kill you. They wait at that light. And if you don't know you when you're at a light like this, what's the first thing you do when you're at a light? Oh, you're yeah. fidgety, right? Yeah. You got 12 fucking clicks to the fucking guy puts his hand on and it becomes a yellow. That means actually you got, from the time a fucking t- light turns yellow to red, it's three seconds. So if it says 12, you got, if you go reach to your left and you go like this in Burbank. Yeah. And so just to see what time it is, and that cop is over there, you're getting pulled over. Yeah. Fuck. So, here I am, reeking of fucking reefer. <laughs> reeking. I close my car door, and I walk the proper way onto the sidewalk, and I walk to the crosswalk. Well, guess who's at the fucking cross? Now I know that this don't smell like reefer, because I smell some Febreze on me. But you always got that essence of patois when you smoke a joint in your car. It just sinks into your clothing. (laughs) Yeah. With my luck, guess who stands next to me? Who the fuck do you think comes and stands next to me? Worse than a cop. Especially for guys like me and you because we understand where they're coming from. A kid. That's A mom with a kid. With a stroller. With a kid. And I am embarrassed, mm-hmm. and I feel like the biggest piece of shit junkie there is. I really needed to smoke a joint on Magnolia. Really, Joey? Yeah. Really, Joey? 54 years old. <laughs> and I'm standing, I look up, and there's like 92 clicks left. I, I, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. She's standing next to me. She's going to smell the weed with her kid, and she's going to comment. I would. I yeah. would. It's fucking 2 o'clock. Really, Joey? You really got to be high at fucking 2 o'clock? Do you know that we take 10 steps together? She looks over at me, and I see her take a double look. And by the time we get to the sidewalk, I walk over first to let her in. You know how you have to, if you have a child, you have to go to that sideway. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the whole time she was looking at me, and she goes, Hey, man, I love you on the Joe Rogan podcast. And I nearly shit. My fucking pants. She smelt the reefer. That's why she was smiling. Oh, do you know how good I felt? That's the first time that's a, a rede- woman. That's a redeeming. Usually, a guy like me, anybody who comes up and says, "Hey, I seen you on a podcast. I like to suck your dick." That would be <laughs> the ideal situation. And this woman was a Burbank mom. Yeah. Do you understand me? This just. I understand you, you. You understand. I understand you. When she looked at me and smiled like. Wow, this is Burbank is the expensive part of the valley. Yes, that's where when you live, it's, it's Burbank. I, to I had no Lake. idea. I, I didn't know, and and it, like those little small houses are astronomical prices. First of all, tomorrow we'll get high, and we'll take a clicker with us. See how many houses are for sale in Burbank. Take, we'll take a it's clicker. A lot. With us. People don't sell their house in Burbank because it's a great school district. 
amazing school. It's so like the people don't sell. It's insane. Where Joey and I live, people are buying houses for two million dollars. That's how good the school district is. And like and like and we're we're in the cheap on that. Like we're not living in those I'm big renting. mansions. I'm renting. And I love it. And we look around and we're gonna find the right fucking thing one day and we're gonna catch somebody asleep. Yeah. That's it. Either that or we're praying for an earthquake. <laughs> Once the earthquake hits, these motherfuckers run out of here. Like oh, we're, we're, we're building a pool. We're not going anywhere. You are going underground? Leanne's, Leanne, Leanne is fucking happy. She's happy. She's got the car she wants. She's got the house she wants. The girls are happy. They love their high school, their uh, middle school. I think they're going to go to private school. I think they're both going to go to private school next year. Why? Because uh, George is going to go to high school, and North Hollywood High School isn't the best high school. I think there's there's like a zoo magnet that's really good. I don't know. I, I'm only listening, but there's. A, I think Leanne wants her, them to go to this this uh, private school that our friends. Kids now, right now, you work very hard. You so go on the road. Hard. You earn every dollar. You get the podcast. You got your little TV shows. When you were 25, did you ever think that you were going to be coming home to support a family and not <laughs> blink an eye? When I was 25, you couldn't get a dollar out of me. I didn't give a fuck if you were my wife and that was my uh, kid. You understand me? I'm uh, the one that was digging trenches. Joey, At 28, Joey, I Joey, loosened up. We're in, uh, we're in London. I'm doing a show in London. I'm doing a podcast in London. I fly the girls over, right, in like a sofa bed on New Zealand Air. Like I fly them over. Not 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 first class, but in a nice thing. I, f- I fly over first class, right? I get us a driver. We go out to go see this castle with our friends, and we go up to this little, this little uh, inn on the Thames River, on the way to go to this castle we're going to. And the driver hops out, and I'm getting ready to hop out, and Leanne stops me. She goes, "Take two seconds and feel really proud of yourself." I said, "Why?" She goes, "Your silly little jokes afforded all of this." Like, just you coming up with silly jokes. You just... And, you know, it's one of the things I love about Stanhope. It's like, I had that moment where I went, like... I went, yeah, man, I just... I just have, like, a... I just... I, I think I'm a good person. I think that's number one. That's why I work. You know, I'm, I'm a good person. But I do... I like being silly, and I like giggling. I like having a good time. But I... And I had a great moment that I thought, not only can I afford to pay for their lunch, but I can pay, I can afford this trip off of stand up, off of stand up comedy. And then I called stand up one night. It's one of my favorite stand up stories. And it's not a great story, but it's just, it's, it's nuanced. I think if you're a comic, you get it. I called stand up. I'm, I'm, uh, sitting in the man cave. I'm having a cocktail. Every now and then we'll just call and just talk for a little while. I just called him up. I go, Hey, what are you doing? He's like uh, sitting out uh, outside the fun house, having a cigarette, having a vodka in my pajamas, just trying to think of some goofs. I said, what? He goes, just thinking of some goofs, you know, some like goofs, some goofy things. I go, you're 50 and your, your life consists of sitting around in your pajamas, having a cocktail, thinking of goofs. I go, that is the fucking dream job right there, is being 50 years old and just sitting around and daydreaming about something that's silly. You know? It's the best. The If you said dream job is you on Rogan the other day, and you go, it's changing flavors. When I heard that, I was doubled fucking over, and I went... That's no job. I mean, that's for anyone else. That's no job, but that's your job. Oh, it's the fucking. I might be too fucked up to have these thoughts. I'll but never like, forget that teacher. Like I farted. It's changing flavors. Like, listen to what happened. I farted, and it was, it took over the bus for about twenty minutes, right? What? And it was those windows that you had to open up this way with the two. You had to pinch them. You had to pinch them and drop them. That never worked. And they had the windows oh open, and they're like, it's this. changing flavors. They're smelling out the window, right? Oh my god! They're going, oh, that's terrible. Half of the people are going like this, right? So then, yeah, it settled down for like twenty minutes, and about twenty minutes later, my stomach is fucking hurting. It's on fire. I'm like, oh my god, I can't thought again. And all of a sudden, I felt that warm air just slip out of my ass. Oh. <laughs> and I was on the outside seat. It was two men per seat. And the guy next to me never even said, it's coming from here. <laughs> I paralyzed him or something. Like a nerve agent. Oh. So, 
Oh. So listen to me. The beauty of this was that so the, the first fart took off for about 20 minutes. And then they were like, actually, it's like, cheese like, like, flavor. like it is the beauty of it. That like, one by one, they were going. What flavor was the first one? It was death. The first time. So now they're taking their hands off. And this is what I remember. I'll never forget that. They were like, is it safe? I'm like, oh, my God. It's safe to smell. <laughs> the chili is the, the chili is in the front of the bus. They're like, oh, that was so bad, and we're in the back, and <laughs> some of the guys are <laughs> giggling. And, you know, there was a dude like Mutz. He was like 300 pounds, and all he ate was mozzarella cheese. Mutz. <laughs> he was the first one they were looking at, God rest his soul. You know, there was a couple dudes that were a little chubbier. You know, at that time, I was 140, 148. Really? It didn't really look like it come out of me. I just ate like a bad steakum. Yeah, a bad something. steak. Oh, I miss steakums. Oh, my God. I, and next thing you know, I feel that warm air coming out of my What do you mean you feel it coming <laughs> out? It's an Here's the funny thing. that It was quiet for about two minutes. <laughs> and all of a sudden you hear somebody go, oh, no. <laughs> and people like, no, no, open the way. And all of a sudden the teacher smelt and he goes, He's changing flavors. Oh, it was terrible. And next thing you know, it, it was bad. This one was like the thickness of it. I dropped three of them that night. That was the second one. The second one had them going fucking bananas. Oh. Like, oh, no. Bus driver, please pull over. I'm going to get sick. Like that shit. Like that type of shit. And the people were saying, poop. Puke in your bags if you need to puke. Oh. And I'm sitting there howling. And in all that howling, I drop another one. Like, I gave him 20 minute breather in between the first and the second one. Oh. This one was a trembler. I hit him with one, and like six minutes later, they got the core of the asshole, and they could not deal with it. The chilies were crying. It's not going to stop. It's not going to stop. Maybe it's not the. But May, they, they started blaming it on the engine. It's the engine. They were blaming it. They were blaming it on everything they could. Oh. Till this day, those people oh. don't know that it was my juicy asshole. They don't know. The, the only reason why I didn't say that was me was because of Chile is. You're a, you're a fucking freshman. Yeah. yeah I'm going to be known uh. for the kid who stunk up the bus by all those <laughs> girls. None of those girls are going to date me. So I couldn't come out and say, I'm the guy. If that was just a bus filled with football guys, uh. oh, my God. I would have pulled my own finger. I would have got up and lit my asshole on fire. <laughs> oh, that's what happened. The second time, he goes, oh, no, he's changing flames. Oh, that fucking and he man, held on to so his hard. face. Stop saying that. I was on the treadmill, and I, I grabbed onto both the handlebars on the side and was double over laughing. It was, it's funny because it's like you're watching Joe lose his shit, Tommy lose his shit, and you're oblivious to the fact that it's that funny. <laughs> I took the comic to Brea. When I was booking Brea, on Wednesday nights, Vinny Lightbulbs, a.k.a. Vinny Coppola, moved to North Hollywood, and I bumped into him, and I asked him if he had a gig, and I gave him a... And in front of Vinny, I told the story about that place in Tennessee. But I went on stage, and the chick was... The husband was... Oh, yeah, 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 And she yeah, blew yeah. me, and then yeah. she went back in. You told me that story one night, but like, not on a podcast, just the, talking. Like, who does that happen to... Man, like, not me. First of all, who goes to Knoxville? Comedians and students. I, I like that club. I've never been to that club, but I've seen it because the new club. You no, know, the the old one, the one that was like that white box or that box. This was the, when I was there. It was in a hotel. It belonged to Hef. Oh, okay, it was a two nighter. It Hef, was a Friday. Hef from Charlotte. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that guy. All those guys. Yeah, Creative Entertainment. They're brothers or something. I don't know. I don't know what the deal yeah. was. The deal when I moved to LA. There was a manager here that I signed with, and he had just left creative. Yeah. They were huge because they had Carrot Top. They were huge. He's they, a, they, yeah. He was huge at that time. They had just shot the movie, and the three guys were like, well, we can't fight over Carrot Top, so let's just split them three ways, and we're not part, you know. They got wow. greedy because it was three guys, and they, they one of them said we should manage them. And, and then, of course, course because it's three guys, they want the big deal. The big deal. It's not about, like, getting this career off the ground. You know, Bert, you said something interesting. Joe Rogan has been saying it for 20 years. 
Ralphie said it to me today when I spoke with him, and I realized it six years ago. We're stand-up comics. I was a mediocre stand-up comic till I started this podcast. Mediocre at best. Me I was a funny guy that didn't know how to organize anything. And I started listening to Rogue, and I started going back to the comedy store. Six years I've been back, five years, whatever it is. I started watching Delia and Sebastian and Ron White and Chappelle. And, you know, I remember going to Columbus the first time for Justin and just eating a bag of dicks the whole weekend. And he didn't book me for a year, Drew. And I'm like, I know why, because I ate a bag of dicks. I wasn't really headlining. Now we got it down. Now it all came yeah. together at the same time. The stand-up, the form, the the fucking technique. Now you have you add a, this aspect to it. You add the aspect of coming onto a podcast, telling your point of view about something, but at the same time explaining why you're saying that point of view. You lived it. You have to give it a chance and let it breathe for a few days. Yeah. You can make assumptions. You know, it's like what happened today. Shocked the fucking world. I mean, shocked me. I had just gotten some weed, and I put it in front of the heater to dry. I left it in front of the heater to dry, and I went to take Mercy swimming. And while I'm sitting there watching Mercy swimming, I'm like, I forgot to take the heater off. So while they were showering and getting dressed, I ran home. The heater was off. I was so high, I forgot that I fucking turned it off. Yeah. But as I was walking out, Lee called me and said that John Jones had been... Yeah. Whatever with the steroids. It it was a kick to my fucking stomach. Like it was a kick to my fucking stomach, you know? Uh I went back, my wife was putting mercy in the car. I, go, I gotta tell you something, when you get in here, you're not gonna believe this. You know, we were both cheering for him. Yeah. We both uh believed something, you know, and, and I was disappointed. And my wife couldn't fucking believe it. You know, she was like, how could this happen? And then we went to eat, and a friend called, and she was just going off. She's like, I finally believed them, blah, 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 And, you know, he's in his fucking 20s, Bert. Do you think yeah. if you threw a million dollars at me when I was in my 20s, I was going to show up at 6 o'clock in the morning somewhere? I hope you don't really believe that. <laughs> Yeah, I really hope you don't believe that. That when I was 27, if you gave me twenty thousand dollars and said I had to be somewhere at eight in the morning, and I was gonna be there. I wouldn't be there. Oh. My twenties were a fucking disaster. I don't know about you. Lee was a little bit more controlled. He took his. He didn't take as many chances. There's some people I went crazy. Like like looking at me from what I did, like the stuff I've done. I, like, I would never thought I would do that stuff at all. What, like the acid? Yeah, that stuff, and then, like, stand-up, and that stuff. Life is an experience, man. It's so weird, nothing happens till you do it, you know? Yeah. Like, you could sit there and read all the books you want about scumbags who did this, and you're buying <laughs> into that bullshit. <laughs> Meanwhile, you're sitting there reading about somebody else's fucking life, you fucking moron. You know... I, we were talking about the other day how where we grew up in the areas we grew up in. I'd like to figure out how many people actually left our area. Where I came Not from, many. No, for me. where I came from, they either went to Miami, and when they do vacation, they go to Miami or Atlantic City. That's the big weekend, the AC. Yeah. Uh, some of them left for... I wouldn't have left if I had family. Cool. I would have never left if I had family. I had no family. I had a chance to fucking get up and go and watch what was going on. The stand-up got me to leave. I was like, I can't do stand-up in Florida. I'll just end up staying in Florida. Yeah, so I'll, be, I'll be funny, I'll get a radio gig, and I'll just stay in Florida. Like, I'll never leave. And I won't be ever run my own radio show because I don't have that kind of interest in that. I'll just be the third mic. Of God, and I'd, I would have ended up so fucking hacky. And well, thank God I left. You're lucky because the warrants got me to leave. Really? The warrants, a couple of loan sharks. I had no I had no fucking clue. Then I left. Made it out of there. Then nobody said nothing. I went back and got more. And got greedy. And I started fucking around with drug dealers. Yeah. And fronting from fucking drug dealers. And then I had to fucking leave. And uh, I'm happy I did. I, I, every time I go to San Francisco, 
the second day it destroys me. Really? Yeah, because that's the first, that's one I went to. I went to first. I went to basalt, and then I lived in basalt for a month and a half. And we were going to give up the house. And me and my buddy from Jersey moved to a, an apartment in Snowmass. And we were there for a while. And then I started burglarizing the businesses and dro- drug dealers in the area. In Snowmass? And they got hot to me. And I came back to Jersey. And I it's, called- By the way, for no one who's ever been to Aspen, or uh, Aspen is such a small community. Oh, please. <laughs> It was terrible, terrible, terrible. It's like burglarizing I'm a town ashamed of 1,200 people. I still remember Christmas Eve 1984. There was an article that said four businesses, mur- four businesses burglarized on Christmas Eve. You know what that was? What? Me being at home, feeling sorry for myself. I had a little package of Coke in my pocket. I go, let me go for a fucking walk and see who's out. <laughs> let me go I, see who's I fucking go for a walk. I go to this, the only bar that's open. On Christmas Eve, filled with losers. I'll never forget there was one guy playing, playing the bongo. I'll never forget this as clear as day. And a friend of mine took a bottle, shook it up, and shouted at the guy, like, What the fuck is wrong with your life? That set the tone for the night. In those days, I used to drink Southern Comfort and Orange Juice. It's called a Tequila Sunrise. I don't know. No, no, no. It's called a Southern Sunrise. What are you, an American bartender? Yeah, no, I have had that drink. I had that drink one time. I so, had it at Malios. At this time, that was my drink. I was 19, maybe 20. And I do. Listen. I'm going to be honest with you. One of the things I didn't like about drinking was you come to me on a Tuesday night and go, Joey, I got enough money for an eight ball. Let's take a ride. I go, you know what? Go fuck yourself. Give me a Southern Comfort. Give me a second Southern Comfort. Give me a third Southern Comfort. I'll do anything for you. So I would go have. I would be a regular guy, and in those days, I would have three or four Southern Comforts, and I became fucking Coco. Yeah, I would leave there like a fucking savage, and I would have to rob something. Like I would have to rob kicking the door. Something. Yeah. It was crazy. On this one night, I left this fucking place. It was like two in the morning. It's fucking Christmas. I got no girlfriend. I live with a guy. He's got a girlfriend. They're gone. I'm going to go back and finish this package in my pocket. I go, let me see what the fuck's going on. And I kicked in like four doors. And finally, one door, I found the safe. You know what I did? I took the safe to go. In those the days, safe to go. Oh, in those days, safe for the go. You just grab the safe and walk out. On a fucking one of those carts. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> then you take it home and bang on it for three hours like you know what you're doing. <laughs> then and you finally got to call around for a week until you got to get a, get, a, get a guy who knows how to have a blowtorch with a shut. And up with those slippery around. fingers. Lee? Lee, are you asleep? No, I'm just, I'm, I can't believe what I'm hearing. I, like, how do you... Like, aren't you worried about the cops coming? When I was a kid, I watched a movie called Thief. Yeah. I was, and it fucking molded me. So I wanted to be a full time thief. So for a while, I remember I brought, when I robbed Martin the Fag, you know how I did it? How? I fucking got those <laughs> suction cups. I thought I was fucking the Pink Panther. I got suction cups like an idiot. Bird Christ, you ready for this? Yeah. Because you know me, I was Johnny Mafia. You learned to be a, a burglar on move from movies? Like, you just, like, took all their tricks? Huh? You like took all the tricks from movie bur- movie burglars. Oh my god! Like that's what you did. Put on fucking. Oh no, Lee! You are I. The thief. You are the highest I've ever seen you. No, not that this high. is nothing. We have for even, real. No. We got. We're still doing the second half of the podcast. We got to eat some more stars. Oh Jesus Christ! John. This is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> how long? Morning. How long have we been going? Three hours. Oh, we should probably wrap it up. I have to work out in the morning. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I watched this movie. What movie? The Thief with James Caan, 1981. You never saw this, did you? Uh-uh. Just one scene I'll show you, and you go home and tell okay. me, and you got to watch it. Just put it up. What what scene? Click it up on the fucking thing. Okay. You're the, you're the, we, hey, what was the deal with Ellen Chenoweth? Is she Christian Chenoweth's? No, 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 no. You're Chenoweth. horrible. <laughs> That's the you, other you try to eat all these things. We only ate what? You only ate six of them, Lee. Stop complaining. I ate more than six. How many did you eat? You gave me like eight. I ate like 12. Of course. No, I ate 10. That was it. 2,000. Just like, what are you doing, Lee? You're tired. You're sending a letter to the Navy? Trying. 
So I watched this movie, and then I went back to Jersey, and my friend turned me on to his friend, and he used to get me jobs to go to warehouses and case the joints out and let him know where the safe was and shit like that. The Thief. English subtitles? Hold on, hold on. Was it a... No. Pressing the Thief, James Conn. With capital letters, please. What, what is it? What are, we, what are we in the first grade? Oh, there you go. There you go. No, just James Conn. Yeah. All right. Click on to badass. Nobody ever saw this movie that won like Conn's. Watch no. this. And I'm going to show you something else, too, guys. You're going to learn something from watching this scene. You know, I don't show you no fucking bullshit. Lee. I've been rocking your world all week. This is, what's his name? You didn't get a delivery or something? Sit down. Zinc, what? My name is Frank. And that was bullshit. What is it? This is Joe Gags. 185,000 of my money. We have this problem. What problem? What are you talking about? He was moving my merchandise. So the money in his pocket when he went out the window is my money. This is a plating company. What are you telling me this shit? Shit? I want my money. Hey, I don't know what you're talking about. Mr. Frank, uh, Lala, whatever. Some guy died? Yes. Your state goes to probate. Take it to probate court. What do you bug me with this? I come here to discuss a piece of business with you. And what are you gonna do? You gonna tell me fairy tales? Hey, who the fuck are you, Slick? Somebody knows you? What are you, crazy or what? I don't know you. I don't know some clown named Gags. Go, go see what you gotta do. Get out of here. Carl! Go ahead, get the fuck out of here. Hold. All right, all right. Jesus Christ. Hold. I... Do what he says. Do what he says. Lay down. Go ahead. Put your hands on your head. Spread your legs. Now. Hey, you, you goof, look at the wall. I am the last guy in the world that you want to fuck with. You found my money on gigs. Let us pretend that you don't know whose money it is. That's right, for Christ's sakes. I don't know who you are. Three hours. I will call to set a meet. You will pay me my money, one hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars. This is how the movie starts. Who wow. Was that time. This one. This movie was fucking. The problem with this movie is it didn't hit the country. They came out on HBO. Wow. And it was on the same month as The Raging Bull and uh, Hollywood Nights. Click onto that one scene under his. You go all the way to the thing. All right. Uh, the other one. The other direct. There. Yeah, click onto that. This movie will blow your fucking mind. And you're also going to... Who directed this, Lee? You know who directed this? The guy that did Miami Vice. He's big time. He directed Heat. All he did when he wrote Heat was rewrite this. Nobody saw it. Wait, uh, uh, I know who Michael Mann. About. Michael Mann. This is it. He released this in 81 and nobody saw it.
que é babaca. Hey, car sales. You ritzy. You remember my name now? I've come in now. Since the police department does not hide to many Puerto Ricans. Hey, asshole, I'm Italian. I'm pleased to meet you, ugly wop, son of a bitch. You mother. <laughs> You're a stand-up guy. You're a real stand-up guy. You got a mouth. You can take a trimming. You could make things easy for everybody. But no. You gotta be a goof. You're real good. No violence, strictly professional. I'd probably like you. Like to go to the track, ball games, stuff like that, you know? Frank, there's ways of doing things that round off the corners. Make life easy for everybody. What's wrong with that? There's plenty to go around. We know what you take down. We know you got something major coming down soon. But no, you gotta come on like a stiff prick. Who the fuck do you think you are? What's the matter with you? You got something to say or uh, you waiting for me to ask you to dance. It never occurred to you to try to work for a living, take down your own scores. Okay, fuck this guy, tell you something. I'm gonna be on your ass so much, you're gonna get careless. And on that Except day, Bruno, uh... I'm gonna be in that place. And that is the last place that you wanna be. Because no matter what happens, I will never, ever take a pinch from a greasy motherfucker like you. You got oh, mother, you fucker. But kill you, you right here. Fucking dance goes two ways. Break. Get this asshole out of here. Cut him loose. Telling you guys, if you get the chance Jesus. to watch this movie from beginning to I end, I want to watch it now. Who's it? Who are? Who's it? The cast. I think I feel like I know the cast. The cast is Death. The cast is Belushi's brother, and you ready for this one? Yeah. Uh, the country western singer. Who? Go back to Thief for a second there, cuz. Uh, and the guys that lay down on the floor. When he told them, go back to scenes, like scenes from the YouTube that you had before. You know who's one of those guys that lays down? Dennis Farina. Is that who that was? That's who it was. That's I was thinking it was his uh, first movies. No, no, not the guy that shakes him down and he calls him Puerto Rican to none of that shit. Who's that? He was an actor that was around for that. I think he did a couple episodes of Miami Vice. But he was basically in a TV show that Michael Mann did called Crime Story. What year was this? Which one am I looking at? 1981, The Thief. James Kahn. Okay, keep going. All right, down. yeah, James Kahn. Keep going. Scrolling. Willie Nelson. <laughs> yeah, Willie Nelson. James Belushi. Yeah, keep going. Dennis Farina. Scroll down, Lee. For the love of Christ. Hold on. Keep going. The yeah, ending, ending. Or oh, confrontation. <laughs> you see it up there right in front of you? No, up more. Up more, right there. The next one. There you go, you fucking... That's what this confrontation do. Anima confrontation. There you go. I'm giving you some good fucking scenes here. This movie, guys, drove me fucking crazy. I was done. I wasn't going to go to college. I wasn't going to do nothing with my life. I was going to get a gun and figure out how to open up safes for a living. Yeah, this is one of the movies from the 80s. The problem with movies from the 80s is it takes a long time to get to where you're going. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, at this time, this guy sitting on the couch was big from Hill Street Blues. This is, you know, you ever see those movies that you look and you go, ah, that's an easy script, I could have wrote that? 
Yeah. This is one of those scripts that you're like, this is a pretty good fucking script. The, the, the fucking, the way they, yeah, no, you can just tell. Who's that guy? Who's that guy right there? He was, anything shot in Chicago, they used this fucking Yeah, I know that guy. These are all Chicago actors. All those movies they did. The Stephen Wolf crew. The Blue, what, what, what is that? Uh, the Breakfast Club, all those movies they were doing. Brothers, the Blues Brothers. Jesus Christ. Oh, wow. That seems a little bit much. I would well, definitely thought I would have heard that. What are you gonna do? Sometimes you gotta hit people in the head. Look at the mother. She's like, you know what? I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. I'm not gonna call nobody. I don't wanna know nothing. I'm just gonna sit here and watch my novella. He's gone. Yeah, this movie had some scenes that you're like, Jesus. And Bert, it was on every night, either in the same order. HBO didn't have a lot of money in 1982. This was an HBO movie? This was a movie that I first saw on HBO. Oh, wow. And I first started seeing this in HBO in like January or February of 82. It was on every night, followed by Raging Bull or Hollywood Nights, or they would flip-flop them. So every night I'd get home, the nights I wouldn't do blow, I'd get home, and me and Mike Runny would walk down to Padmark with like 10 bucks, shoplift 10 bucks worth of stuff, go home, make milkshakes, eat a sandwich, and watch this. He's walking down a hallway <laughs> with a gun. Thank you, Lee. I forgot to narrate it. I didn't know. I thought they could see it, but unless you're home watching, you can't see it. Standing All on. you need to know is this weekend you're going <laughs> to sit there with your thumb up your fucking ass watching preseason football, watch a film that's a classic, 1981, The Thief, James Kahn, Tuesday Weld, Willie Nelson, and Belushi's brother, and I gotta tell you something, Belushi's brother's fucking good in this. I saw him on a plane one time, <laughs> and I was gonna say something to him, but I, I said, you know what? Why open my mouth? My mouth. Bye, Al. Oh, Super. shit, Grandpa had a gun too. Grandpa's always got a gun. That's what <laughs> Grandpa's thought. <laughs> All right, now fast forward it to him walking outside. Right there, kick it right there. All right, this guy just wakes up. He comes out of his fucking coconut. He shoots him first. <coughs> oh, I like the music. Oh, yeah, this is Tangerine Dream. They were fucking hot in the 80s, 70s. Look at my boy. Look at James Conn shooting like a mother. Look at Dennis Farina's first movie. There you go. That little history for you motherfuckers. And I think Code of Silence was his second movie with fucking Chuck Norris. Who the fuck you think you're dealing with, Bert Kreischer? Some fucking novice. Look at Dennis Farina. Beautiful head of hair. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, no. He's got a bulletproof okay. vest on. He ain't fucking around. He's James Conn, Jack. Yeah, Michael Mann was thinking of doing a part two of this, but he just rewrote it and turned it into heat. No! Into the hedges. Farina's first death in a movie. If I ever have to do a top ten movie podcast, this will be in the top ten and I'll blow your fucking mind throughout this movie. Oh, bulletproof vest. Told wow. you. He had a vest on. This guy came prepared. Back from he the was gym. ready for war, this motherfucker. Zombie Farina. Listen, dog. He paid his wife to leave, the baby to leave. He blew up all his businesses. He became a zombie. He has a suitcase in the back of that car with cash, and he's going somewhere to fucking hide. He's done. 
he was robbing for himself, making a great living. He got in bed with some fucking jerk offs. They tried to rob him. He said, I'm getting my money from him. They got pissed off. And that's the end of the movie. He walks away solo like Michael Jackson in 77. You know what I'm saying? I like that gym shot. Listen, for you fucking savages, I will be at the Ontario Improv Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. My brother here, Mr. Burt Kreischer, will be at Stand Up Live. Got it. In Phoenix, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. First show Thursday, 8 o'clock. Listen, that's the best show of the night. You're going to show up. You're going to smoke a couple two salutes. And we do a little extra time because we're trying to find the fucking right combination for the night. Friday early will be sensational. Friday late will be sensational. Then again, if you want to be a Momo and watch the fight, go ahead. If not, come on down to either fucking stand up live in Phoenix or Ontario Improv in the Ontario Mills Mall and hang out with your fucking Uncle Joey. Take a chance Columbus did, all right? That's how we're doing it. Before I leave, I just want to mention one thing to you fucking savages that's very important. You want to look good in your underwear and be comfortable, right? But the perfect balance is hard to find. Don't sacrifice style or comfort. Check out MeUndies.com and find the best pair of underwear in the world. MeUndies will be the most comfortable pair of underwear you'll ever own. Made from some sustainable source, naturally soft fabric that is three times softer than cotton. Ultimate feels, let me tell you something. They're the ultimate feel-good undies for when you want to feel naked, but not be naked. You know what I'm saying? For the fellas, me on these diamond seam pouch cradle, your jewels, and give you stuff to support it needs without feeling too tight. Ladies will love the soft, eco-friendly fabric. So soft and touchable. You get what I'm talking about? 100% satisfaction guarantee. They guarantee you'll love the undies or your money back. All right, right now, MeUndies will offer our listeners, the family, get 20% off your first pair and free shipping. And MeUndies is so sure you'll love the underwear. They even offer a 100% satisfaction guarantee that you'll love them. You order a pair, if you don't love the first pair, you get a full refund. It's that easy. It's a no-brainer to try. 20% off, free shipping, 100% guarantee. What the hell are you waiting for? To get your 20% off free shipping and 100% satisfaction guaranteed. Ready? Write this down. Don't even write this down. Do it right now. MeUndies.com slash Joey. That's MeUndies.com slash Joey. This is a limited time only. So what the hell are you waiting for? Start wearing the best underwear of your life. Hey, they changed my life. I wear them to jujitsu. They keep my nutsack nice and cozy in case I bump into a victim on the way home. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's time to let the MeUndies change yours. Go to MeUndies.com slash Joey right now. And while I got your ear, listen, you're growing up. <laughs> you can't live in your mom's basement no more, all right? You're trying to be a fucking savage. And, uh, you know... <clears throat> What I'm trying to say to you is this, plain and simple. Did you know that depending on where you get your mortgage, you could save $20,000 or more? But 80% of people only get one mortgage offer. And if you just go to your bank, chances are you'll get ripped off uh, slash screwed. You follow me? Lending tree doesn't want that to happen. Here's the thing. The average lending tree customer can save $20,000 over the life of their loan. That's just the average. Half of their customers could save even more. Whether you're looking for a, f a new mortgage, a refinance, or a home equity loan, Lending Tree is the only place where you'll get five real offers from America's top lenders and can compare side by side for free. And it only takes three minutes, okay? It's like shopping for flights online. Only you're shopping for the best mortgage offers for you. Rates always go up and down, but regardless of what happens, what, what's happening with the rates, you can always get the rate, right offer for you, which is the most important thing with LendingTree.com. Are you sure you have the best deal? Let's find out, right? Well, it's going to take you three minutes. Find out how much you can save today 
at LendingTree.com slash church. Today, right now, take a chance. Columbus did. That's LendingTree.com slash church. Again, LendingTree.com slash church. I'm going to save you some money. Go to right now. LendingTree.com slash church. LendingTree LLC. NMLS number 1136. Terms and conditions apply. I want to thank LendingTree. I want to thank MeUndies. I want to thank Audit. I want to thank my main man, Bert Kreischer, for coming in. I love you, Joe. With a bottle, a couple stars, a knife. Lee got it all prepped because he's a fucking professional. And that's how we do it. I'll see you motherfuckers in Ontario. And Bert Kreischer will see you at Stand Up Live in Phoenix. I love you motherfuckers with all my heart. Stay black. Have a great weekend. Thank you very much for listening. You fucking savages. Thank you.